And I will our esteemed secretary to please drum roll. I mean, uh, call the roll, please. You got it. Okay, Greg, you here? Yes. Ann? Here. Kimberly? Yes. I'm going to say Claire's not. Claire? No. Uh, Dan? Here. Gus? Yeah. And I'm here. Okay. Uh, well, we have a special feature tonight. We have the esteemed president of the Coastside Fire Protection District with us, uh, Mr. Gary Burke. And we're going to lead off with him talking to us about the Moss Beach Firehouse, uh, the new one that is. Let me just make sure, Gary, can you? Yes. There you are. Okay, Gary, do you need me to give you control of the computer or anything to share a screen and show a slide, or what do you want to do? Keep the slide for just a moment, Mr. President. Okay. So we're ready when you are, Gary. Okay. Thank you. Mr. President and uh, members of the council, I want to thank you for inviting me to provide a brief update on the status and plans for our exciting new fire station in Boss Beach. But first of all, let me just give you a two minute overview and update on the Coastside Fire Protection District. Uh, as I think members of the council may understand, but perhaps not all the citizens of the Coastside, that we are an independent special district and we're not part of the county or, for example, the city of Half Moon Bay. Uh, you may be aware that the Coastside Fire District was formed by the merger of the old Point Montero Fire District, which uh, used the fire station in Moss Beach as its headquarters some years ago, and then there's the City of Half Moon Bay Fire District to form the Coastside Fire Protection District in 2007. Today, the Coastside Fire takes approximately 3,500 calls per year for fires, emergency calls, and that type of thing. We have, as you probably know again, three stations. Uh, they have staff for 24 hours a day. Uh, they each have a paramedic on duty uh, 24 hours a day. Our revenue for the district happens to be around three and a half million dollars for this year, uh, which 90% of that comes from uh, property taxes. The fire district gets approximately 16% on average uh, of property taxes to support us. We have not had a tax increase since the district has been formed, and even prior to the district being formed, it's been some decades before there was any kind of a tax increase here in the coast. In fact, in the old Point Montero district, there's been three uh, small tax reductions uh, in the last few years. Uh, we have no employees, uh, which is very unusual today. We provide all services uh, through contracts, of which we have some probably 30 plus contracts for IT services on the engines and that type of thing. Our largest contract by far is with Cal Fire. Uh, we are currently in our second seven year contract, a very detailed contract with Cal Fire uh, to provide operations and management services here on the coast. The cost for the Cal Fire contract for this year for your information is some uh, $9 million. Uh, that contract, by the way, has saved Coastside taxpayers literally millions of dollars over the past 10 to 12 years. And a number of the improvements we've made in both facilities, equipment, new fire engines and that type of thing would absolutely not have been possible without our uh, contract with Cal Fire. They have done just an outstanding job and I assure you the board is extremely pleased with their performance. Uh, with that said, uh, of course, the Board of Directors continues to have control. We provide a strategic plan for direction of the district. All policies are made by the Board of Directors. We have complete judiciary responsibility uh, to take care of all items. Currently, for your information, we have some $15 million in total reserve. The bulk of that is put aside for the new station that I'll speak to in just a moment in Moss Beach. And the board certainly has oversight on all the contracts that we have. Uh, we do have a very active volunteer program. 
uh, here. We have some uh, over 20 volunteers who have been a real asset uh, to the district and to the citizens on the coast side. Uh, the, uh, we also sponsor and train the SWIT program, which I'm sure the board and your listeners are very familiar with. It. They have done just an outstanding job and has probably the most outstanding SWIT program, certainly in California. And last, regarding just the background of the Coastside Fire District, for the past uh, five years, the California Special District Association has awarded us the District of Distinction for the overall management, direction, and financial responsibility of the of our district. And of that, of course, we're very, very, very proud. Let me now change and address very quickly the where we stand with the new uh, station. Uh, in 2013, approximately around that time, the board became aware that we had not one antiquated, outdated station, but two. The one currently in Moss Beach, and as well as the El Granada station, both. And uh, we, st we studied the situation, tried to find if, for example, at one point we looked to see if we could cover both areas with one station in the middle, that was not possible because we would not have meet our time commitments to reach each area of the district. So the question was, do we try to fix them or do we try to uh, replace them? And the, the final decision was that we, they needed to be replaced. We had some very uh, strong consulting studies advising us, and that was the direction we, we took. Uh, uh, as you might expect, uh, we did not have the money to replace the, either of the stations, but the Cal Fire contract provided us the savings of millions of dollars that have allowed us to go forward with replacing Chris El Granada and now working on the one that's in Moss Beach. Uh, we chose and built the El Granada station first simply because it handles more calls than does the station uh, located in Moss Beach. Uh, the current study on in uh, uh, in Moss Beach was done and continues to be done by a very prominent uh, architectural firm and so forth. PDK was selected by the board to provide the outlines and uh, drawings and type of things that will ultimately become final and result in a, uh, a new station. Uh, I'd emphasize that we're in very early stages of development and trying to work through, and I'll mention some of the dates in just a moment that we're working on. The, uh, the location of a fire station is very critical in order to reach all areas within the jurisdiction with a certain time period. And we have hopefully met that we have met those requirements and done it. Uh, very uh, excellently in the last few years. Uh, as we go forward with this building that I'll describe in just a moment, the we will need undoubtedly a temporary location for our firefighters to live and work out of uh, during the period of time that the station will be under construction. Uh, in terms of the station plans as it now stands, and again, I emphasize that there are meetings going on weekly in terms of how the station will look and be built. A lot of it is coming together uh, in very uh, strong position, and I'm pleased with that. But uh, in final design, the station will be somewhat close to 11,000 square feet. Uh, we are currently looking at uh, doing a lot of soil removing, put, uh, removal, putting up stationary retaining walls around uh, the station. It will be, as it's described, as a pull-through station. Currently, the fire engines back into the station, uh, but this will allow the new fire engines to enter from the left facing the station, will enter from the left and pull through. The station will hold our largest vehicle, that is the ladder truck, will we'll also be uh, able to be uh, placed in the station. Currently, by the way, our newest fire engines, which we 
just received two of them uh, a month ago. Those new state new engines will not even fit into the the old station. Uh, the the work on uh, if you look at the drawing of the uh, the mock-up of the station and facing it on the left, you'll find on the bottom portion of it, it is planned for the meeting rooms, the actual offices for the firefighters and offices that will be in there. The firefighters living quarters will be up above and the actual bays will be on the right hand side facing uh, the uh, facing the Is there supposed to be a, I'm sorry, sorry. is there supposed to be a, a slide? Well, we don't have a slide. It's not falling. Yeah. I'll tell you what it's I, Greg, can you put that up? I, I don't have it from you, Gary, but I'll tell you what I do have. It was have. up for a moment. No, that was a slides from Ann. We had slides from Ann, okay? Um, and I had another document. If you just bear with me a second here. I had another document, I think. Uh, here, maybe this will help. Share screen. This was from your architect, Gary. Yeah, okay. Does that that shows it, it, that shows it be the, the bays, the red areas are uh, the two bays, if you will. And on the left, on the bottom, it's actually two story on the left. The bottom will be the offices and facilities, the meetings, the cruise quarters will be on the second level. So that's a rough idea. And as we're facing this, you'll see the the fire engine would enter from the street, go around to the back, and, and so it would be a full through station. The plan current schedule is that we will uh, confirm with the architects the floor plan as well as the uh, exterior design of the station. And by the way, a lot of this will be on the Coastside Fire District's website uh, will be up to date. Uh, but the exterior design and the floor plan will be completed certainly within the next 60 days. And we placed up on the uh, on a website. Uh, we will be uh, submitting plans to San Mateo County because this is in county land. Uh, as soon as those plans are available, the CEQA and EIR, EIR process will be undertaken. Uh, this uh, by the end of the year in November and December. Uh, we hope to award a construction contract in uh, uh, the third quarter of 2024, third quarter of 2024, and have a groundbreaking for the construction at that same time. The construction would be completed uh, sometime uh, due date is in uh, the end of 2025 uh, and we would have a final acceptance of the new building in the first quarter of 2026 is our current schedule for doing that. The, uh, they will be uh, part of the CEQR and the EIR process. There will be public meetings held uh, and each month that anybody would certainly uh, would like to express their opinions or give us advice. Uh, we uh, also have an update each month on our uh, agenda for our regular board meetings on the uh, current status of what goes on each month as it goes by that any citizen or a member of the council would like to comment on. We'd be uh, very open to that. I would just uh, uh, summarize and say from our point of view this is exciting it is a badly needed facility the station when completed uh, certainly will ensure excellent fire and emergency services uh, for the community and as well as modern facilities for our firefighters for certainly hopefully the next uh, 50 years and with that brief overview uh, if there are any questions i would Certainly attempt to, to answer. Okay, let me uh, just check the list of participants. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Gary, while you were talking, I put up a combination of a slide that Ann Rothman had provided about the current station, and I put up the uh, 
I think you gave us plans from the architects. What? There's also more slides. There should be a one that shows. Yeah, you have more slides too. Yeah. So the, as I get to the questions, you can invite me to show more slides. But let me see first who of our participants had hands raised. Um, I think I'll take. If you don't mind, should I take the the citizens residents first? Okay. So residents first. Sin Young, as usual, you're number one. Inquiring minds want to know, um, Gary, I know that um, sometimes a lot of different uh, mutual aid fire trucks go to Devil's Slide, but do you have any kind of data on how many times the Coast High Fire Protection District has to respond to accidents or cliff rescues, et cetera, on Devil's Slide itself? I do not have any statistics, but as you know, we're there during the course of the year, there are said a number of cliff rescues, uh, and as well as mutual aids in other fire districts here in San Mateo County, and our individual uh, uh, engines and, and crews have been dispatched many times to wildfires throughout the state. Well, I know they're trained for cliff rescue, and I just assume that since Point Montero is the closest one, that they probably get dispatched first, but I could be wrong. Um, and I'm very thankful for everything they do. I've seen them out there many times. I hate to say it. It's always not a good thing when they're out there, but it's it certainly was good for the four people in the Tesla that went over in January. Yeah, um, I guess the only other comment I have to make is I'm looking forward to the new station. I did take the tour, grand tour of the El Granada station when you guys finally had your post-COVID open house, and it was really wonderful. Um, but I do want to say I sure hope you guys put in the low-impact uh, lighting on this fire station because that one in El Granada had a lot of community pushback. That's all. Thanks. So let, me, let me address. Thank you, sir. Let me address the the lighting issue. Uh, first of all, the the station has been there for currently someplace close to fifty years, and it has lighting. We have not had any uh, complaints for neighbors, but that is not to say that we're not certainly open and we'll make every effort to comply with all the regulations. In terms of the new lighting, there's been some interesting discussion informally of having lighting embedded in the new retaining walls uh, as a way of keeping lighting down and yet providing the safety amount of lighting needed for the firefighters themselves. But we certainly are, uh, will do everything we can to ensure that we meet all the requirements and still say, uh, address the safety issues. I'm sure the community will be glad to hear that. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Okay, uh, from the council, um, I guess I should start with Kim. Kimberly, just raise your hand first. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Burke. This was a great, um, uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, sir. So thank you for, for that update. Um, a question about the retaining walls. Um, could you describe those a little more? Are they like the fire station in El Granada, the retaining walls there, or are we talking about something different? Uh, quite honestly, I don't know exactly what the design will look like. My expectation is they will look as much like natural stone as, as possible, and, and I will assume similar to what the walls look like in El Granada. They will not be as high, by the way, but would be of that same material. And is there a reason why you actually need retaining walls? I don't really know much about this, so I'm a little clueless about why you would need those. I I don't know, but it's just to prevent erosion would be my my uh, guess, but I, I don't know the details on it, frankly. And, and then um, will the, Community have a chance to comment on the design um, sure. before it's final. Sure, absolutely. There will be public meetings, at least two and more, and as well as the um, regular board meetings are open to Zoom comments. Uh, if any uh, individual would like to speak to us at that time as well, sure, plenty of opportunity. Great, and then just one last question. 
uh, regarding the lighting. I, pre I appreciate your attention to that. And um, I've looked at quite a few fire stations, especially in the, um, the north, you know, the upper northwest, um, Portland area and Washington. And there seem to be some best practices that fire stations follow now in regard to their design and the lighting. And lighting seems to be, um, you know, dark styles compliant like Dan raises, but it can be very bright. But the difference is that it shines straight down instead of shining out. And so um, I guess I would just urge you to, to um, and your architect to look at those designs and choose appropriately. Yes, and, and interesting enough, our architect has uh, investigated and apparently uh, recommended that kind of downward uh, focus on lighting. Uh, so yes, we'll look at all alternatives. Thank you. You're welcome. If Sue is telling me the truth, next in line from the council, Dan Haggerty. I think uh, Claire was first. Well, yeah, they both have your hand up, hand up, but it's showing you first. Hand she hand had hand her hand up before me. All right, Claire. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's been a proposal made, which I think everybody has kind of scoffed at, but I'm not sure I understand why it wouldn't work. And, and that is that the construction of the new fire station be integrated with the construction of the Cypress Point project, presuming it goes through. Uh, it seems as though you might have more options to get out of the cramped environment of that neighborhood and better access to Highway 1 um, and more uh, space to design something that you might, might really like rather than trying to shoehorn it in at the existing location. If, if it could be worked out where you could somehow share that land would would that make sense to you? Well, uh, first of all, I uh, uh, I am not uh, capable of answering that question in terms of you know what, what we could do in terms of consolidating. However, let me just uh, say to you that when we uh, some years ago decided that we needed to uh, replace the existing station, uh, we hired a consultant to go over every inch of the Point Montero Moss Beach area, trying to find a location close to uh, uh, Rue 1 that would allow us to reach all the uh, areas within the uh, Point Montero area within a certain time limit. And frankly, we came up with zero. We could not find it. We went through county records and everything else. And that's what led us to try and get where we are today of updating the current station. But in terms of consolidating or working with uh, the new development, uh, that's out of my league. I don't, do not know the answer to that. Do you know who who might be willing or able to look at I, it? I assume it would be the, the county gets all county land, I believe. But that's that's just a personal opinion. Well, well currently it's owned by the teachers union. Um, but. Okay, so so you wouldn't be necessarily opposed to it. It's just something that hasn't really come up, and you've done the best you can. And well, yeah, but let me uh, emphasize that we are with with the current design and the ability to store the equipment and reach all areas of the coast side. The location we're currently developing meets all our requirements. We're not, uh, you know trying to pull back on it. We have a very strong location now, so we're really not anxious to try it or need to go and consolidate with another location. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, Claire, Gary, you brought up an interesting point. You had already done a study of available lots that were suitable. Where could we get a copy of that study? It's probably four or five years old of, of you know, showing what you looked at. Sure. Yes, it, it is old, and a lot of it was it, it done by consultants. But I don't. I, I, the answer is yes. It's all public information that you can do it. But uh, we found a couple of locations that uh, were marginal and considered them. And but they turn, for example, they would have to be uh, back in station, not pull through station, and so forth. It just did not provide the kind of flexibility that we felt we needed to build a station that would be an asset for the next 50 years. So we just got it in. 
Um, in well, I think uh, Germany. Uh, Dan? Yeah, and you had your hand up also? Oh, yeah. Well, you, so, yours, would you want to go first? If you want to. I have a lot of questions. So uh, it's up to you, but uh, if you want to put up my slides as well, I right. think it, it would help. I'm here to do the share screen on Ann Rothman's slides. This is one of them. Can everybody see that? This is the one. I don't know what station that is. So this is the this is the current station in Moss Beach. In Moss Beach, and that was the nighttime lighting. That's the third slide I provided. That was for me to show the community that it is quite bright. Mm -hmm. And right now, it is pretty far away from most of the properties, the surrounding properties. The proposed new station would be right next to, if they're proposing to move it completely over next to those homes. If you can see the, the proposed we'll station. Your yeah, maybe we can, I don't know if we can show that. But they want to go where they see the greenery, that's where they want to put the new station, the bay. They want to put the new bay that you're driving into there. This greenery here? Yeah. So they want to see align it basically there. Okay. So my concerns are that you now are impacting far more community members who live there. I'm concerned and I would like to know how you're going to mitigate noise. The average commercial truck that has diesel engines produce approximately 100 decibels of noise. It only takes, uh, I think, let me check my notes here, 15 minute exposure of 80 decibels or greater a day can cause long term hearing loss. I want to know what you're going to mitigate, how you're going to mitigate that for the neighbors who are right next door to this station, as well as the exhaust from the diesel fuel that currently goes through the roof. If you are exhausting that and you're exhausting it right next to the homes that are right there, you know, most of these homes do not have air conditioning in the summer. Your only air is to open windows. You now are exposing the people to diesel fuel, uh, the emissions, you're exposing them to noise and it will be ongoing noise, just the trucks alone. Not even, that doesn't even talk about sirens. And when you have people in Cypress Point, there's going to be far more traffic and you're going to most likely have to use sirens, which you currently, I know, try to reduce the use of sirens um, through the neighborhood. But once that is instituted, once they still build that, you're going to have to let people know to vacate the area so you can get the trucks out. And that too provides at least 120 decibels and this is what the neighbors will have to hear. And it has potential hearing loss that could be caused to the people. And I want to know what you're going to do to mitigate that. And also the rationale for moving it right next to all of these properties. And as you saw with the other video with the light, you can see how much light it puts. Now, all of that is going to go into people's homes. Well, there is no, you know, most likely. If it's down, it's down with folks. No. So and Gary, yeah, so I don't get these it. questions in writing. Well, he can start with that. We'll start with the first one. Start with just noise mitigation. What are you going to do? Do, do we have a site plan that could be up so we can see? Because all these drawings seem to be different, and I'm not sure what is being proposed. This, that's, yeah. this, that, this. that's different from what you sent up earlier. I think maybe did Gary send you something? So this is this the is plan that they're going with. This is this is. Why is it different from what I saw earlier? He was, they were living, showing a look of the living space. What he put was space. just the architect's living space, which is on the left side. The bay is on the right side. And they're moving the station over that now kind of faces this way, and they're putting it right up next to the properties, where right now it's sort of in the center of that lot. All right, so let me just, you heard what she said. Let me just go back to her slide. She sent us this, uh, which slide? This slide? Well, that's existing. This yeah. is the existing. This is the greenery she's saying they're taking out. Where my cursor, can you see a cursor moving there or not? Sure. Yes. You can see it. Okay. And then the next slide I said, uh, I'm blowing these up, shows the thing being cited here. And I think this is what Gary's talking about, about a pull through 
where the trucks could come along here and pull in there. I don't know which direction you'd have the trucks going, but they, no, they, they, they enter on the left hand side and go around through. Yes. Okay, I like that. Let, let me try to help uh, help address your questions. They're very logical questions. Number one, I in my tenure on the board, uh, I don't ever recall having uh, a complaint from any neighbors regarding noise or lighting or anything else. Not to say that there wasn't any, but it certainly has not been a, a major issue. Secondly, we've actually had a suggestion from a neighbor who would uh, uh, recommend cutting back the, the on the right-hand side, the berm on the right-hand side of the station to give us more room in that area. The third point I'd mention is that the new engines that I mentioned earlier that the district has uh, are very clean, very quiet, or a lot quieter than the old ones. So certainly there's not going to be any increase in noise, and there is no plan currently to increase the number of engines that would be stationed in the point uh, in the Moss Beach station. So if you don't have any more uh, trucks coming in, why not just rebuild what the current configuration? I don't understand the need for the drive-through because well, you may not have had a noise uh, problems with the neighbors because you've had a buffer. Up until now, is is away from most of the properties and it's facing in a different location. You have the bay facing in a completely different location than you're currently proposing. What you're currently proposing is right next to people's homes. You can see the bay is on the left-hand side of the station currently, and that is pretty far away from most of the homes. So there is that buffer of noise, of emissions that will be lost when you move the bay to that other side. And I'm also curious why you didn't consider putting the bay yeah, if you wanted to drive through on the other side and having them drive through the right to the left, I'm not sure, or or why simply just not build as it currently is in the center to avoid uh, it, it, potential issues. Uh, and trying to answer some of those questions, first of all, the, all right. <laughs> the current configura configuration would not even allow, would not, uh, the, the new fire engines would not fit so that was one major consideration uh, to do that. And as I mentioned, I am not familiar in terms of the noise. Of, I've not seen any figures at all that there would be any additional noise uh, by driving through, uh, having a drive through. Other than what the uh, current situation is, that the fire trucks come up to the street in front of it, Stetson uh, Street, and back into it, which would just would seem to be to be an awful lot more noisier to the neighbors than just allowing them to drive around in, in, in a quiet fashion. But I do not have any statistics on noise. My, I guess my concern is more about a running truck being next to homes versus now where they're not. And just, just the sound of a running truck is, a, is currently about approximately 100 decibels. And so without putting up a sound wall barrier or something to prevent that, that is a concern that I have for okay. the, the relocation of the station. And well, I, I, I understand I, what you're saying, but there's still also tones that are used when you are uh, sending the trucks out, when they're, when a call comes in, all of that will now be next to homes that currently does not exist. The bay is, is completely flipped to the opposite side, and that's where a majority of the noise the, kind of from. Excuse me, the, the exit from the station would be exactly the same place as it is now. And the, the, uh, they would exit and most likely get out steps. That's an avenue of going to school one. But no, the exit would be the same as it is today. Well, I don't see how that is. If the bay is on the right-hand side of this property, they're coming out closer to the homes. The bay is here, so that it's currently oh, on the I left. See, I see. The yeah, no. They're coming out the right hand side. So when I'm what I'm talking about is the noise of the trucks exiting the station, the call signals. I have to admit, I am a daughter of a firefighter, so I know a lot more about fire stations than the average person. And so 
I just wanted to tell you that. And as far as the emissions, everything that's going to happen is now right next to these properties where it currently does not exist. And so you may not have had complaints, like I said before, because it's on the left-hand side. You're talking about, you know, the most of the firefighter noise is coming out of the bay. It's not coming out of the living quarters. So if the living quarters had been on the other side, then you might avoid a lot of that. But the noise, the lighting, all of that has to be right there at the bay. That's where a majority of the lighting and a majority of the noise will occur, as well as the exhaust from the trucks and just simply coming in and out. You're now, you're exposing people to the diesel exhaust, which currently there's a buffer because it's in the middle of the property. And so that is a major concern of mine. And I, I just want how those I, things will be mitigated. I, I personally uh, understand your comments and the concerns. I would. To certainly expect that the uh, EIR and CEQA studies that will be done uh, before this building is completed will address those problems. Okay, so I mean, I think that's fair. He's also saying the engines are going to be newer and we'll have to see what the noise emanates from that is. I don't know. Yeah. But they're standing at 100. All right. Um, do we have other? Dan Haggerty now? Yes. Did you want to? So um, let me hop on the noise thing real quick. All right, Scott, in the middle of my phone. Okay, oh, hey, sorry. I, I want to talk about the noise thing for a second. Do fire engines have backup warning bells? Uh, I don't know. If they have, I I believe they do. They have. Okay. I'm not sure it's so, a bell, but there is a signal. It goes, it goes beep 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 yeah. when you're backing up. So you have that now because you have to back into those spaces with this. There and that backup bell is very annoying. It's supposed yeah. to be. Right, you're not going to have that with this, right? There's not going to be any more backing up, so then people won't have to listen to that, right? Correct. That sounds awesome to me. No more backup bell. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, sorry, Dan, you said you had 3,600 calls a year on. It, uh, it, it, it is over 3,000. I'm not sure yeah. what will end up this year, but something. Uh, will out, of, out of the two fire stations, out of El Granada and Moss Beach? Three fire stations. There's oh. one in Half Moon Bay. Oh, okay. Half Moon Bay. Oh, all right. 3,000? Over 3,000 out of just those three spots. That's correct. That's fire, emergency services, a wide variety, accidents, the whole thing, all accidents. And if you'd like a listing of what those calls amount to, there is a piece in, I believe, on the web and in our board packet that's the public information that provides the data on that on the numbers the number and the types of calls. Okay. I just thought that seemed like they were very active. Okay. Uh, is it now time for Dan Hager to go? Yes. So, Dan. Yeah. So, um, you know, some of the concerns that Ann brought up uh, uh, with this site plan, the vehicles coming in, you know, uh, on the left side, you know, you're going to have the uh, a 50 ton vehicle that looks like driving five feet away from the residents on the left. Um, so there would be noise impact, there would be exhaust impact. Um, and, um, you know, as far as the lighting, and Gary mentioned the whole CEQA process. Um, the lighting uh, plan at uh, the El Granada station was, you know, a uh, a failure in my part, uh, uh, in my opinion, and, and many others in the community. The MCC uh, wrote a unanimously uh, approved letter to you um, concerning um, the extent of the lighting at the El Granada station. Um, and, uh, you know, the failure was on the district's part was to not use International Dark Sky Association seal of approval fixtures. If those fixtures were spec and uh, used, uh, there would not have been a problem. Um, my question to you tonight, will you commit to using only International Dark Sky Association seal of approval 
light fixtures for the exterior lighting in this project? Well, first of all, I'm an individual and I cannot count the board to do anything. Secondly, uh, we, in terms of the yellow to powder uh, lighting situation, we installed lighting that was approved by San Mateo County. And I assume the same as far as the lighting on uh, in Moss Beach, some updates and, and uh, improvements will be made. But as I said earlier, we're open to what uh, suits the community and uh, addresses the issues and also provides the safety for the firefighters. But I am not familiar with the the code that you mentioned. I have no idea, but we would look at experts and install what what uh, what needs to be done and do it uh, uh, willingly. But I'm not committing. I certainly, remember, I emphasize, I do not know the details of what you're asking, and I personally certainly will not be able to commit to that. So I, I think as a, just if I could make a comment here, the council has questions. I think it's appropriate to write a letter expressing those concerns and asking for what you want rather than just do it in this meeting. I mean, there's going to be a comment period. Why not put it in writing? Okay. Well, uh, you know, Gary's the president of the district, so he has the power to influence the other council members, and he's chosen tonight to not really, uh, sounds well, he, like. He's saying he doesn't make decisions without the other council members participating. I got that. So let's write the council that. and get them to, to reply. I, I think that's a reasonable thing. Yeah, uh, the lighting plan of the uh, El Granada station uh, came in very late in the process, and even today, uh, the lighting plan does not meet the conditions of approval. And, uh, you know, there were some mitigation um, that hasn't been consistent. Um, there's still lighting shining directly across into the wetlands, into the riparian area, which uh, I've seen vehicles uh, parked there, and it looks, you know, a lot like um, this vehicle is in a, in a, in a uh, theater spotlight. And uh, clearly the, uh, the conditions of approval was that uh, no light shall uh, be shining off the property. T today, it, 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 uh, I don't know if you have lights on now, I don't know, maybe it's, it's shining off right, you know, right now. So I'm just um, bringing this up now to kind of, uh, you know, give uh, the district plenty of time to digest this and uh, do the research and, um, um, you know, there was a meeting, I had a meeting with a couple of council, uh, community members and, and uh, Mr. Burke, Supervisor Horsley. Um, so we went, we went over all, all of this in very much detail. And, um, but uh, apparently there's, um, you know, along, along with all of the uh, statements from the uh, uh, Medical Association, um, Sierra Club, uh, the Audubon Society, the uh, uh, Astronomer Society, on and on. Um, if I remember correctly, it was all just kind of not even acknowledged. So I'm, I'm trying to get some acknowledgement that this is important and that uh, the district desires to be a good neighbor and to do the right thing okay. as far as lighting. Okay, I, I should probably read a chat we have here from Barbara Matheson before I go back to the council. Barbara Matheson, who you may know, had been on the council for some years. She says, my bedroom faces directly in front of the PM firehouse. You know, I'm not sure. Bell Fire is a great neighbor. The engines are very quiet. They remove those green bushes every year. Very rare for an engine to just be sitting running. The bright lights, I did complain. They were installed when Cal Fire started leaving the flag up 24-7. I ended up installing blackout curtains. Lighting is a concern for me. So Barbara uh, endorses the concerns about the light. All right, Greg, yeah. Greg, real quick, um, uh, PM is Point Montero. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks, Barbara. All right, Kimberly, you had, uh, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, Mr. Burke, I, I have to say that I agree with Dan Haggerty on this, and the experience with the El Granada Fire Station was very disheartening. Um, the community was pretty much just ignored and there there was very little done to mitigate that problem and the the county you know i understand that the county ultimately contributed to that decision 
but the decision originated with the fire district. And so I'd like to see the fire district pay attention more to the needs of the community and also the environment around us in this coastal area. Um, regardless of what your you know personal feeling is on this, this you serve a community and there has to be trust and understanding between the fire district that serves us in an emergency and, and you know and those who live here and so paying serious attention to this lighting issue i think is important um, I, I agree it is important and it will not be overlooked i appreciate that thank you gus uh hey gary gus monowal good to, good to see you again man nice to see um, you uh so uh, it's just kind of been it, touching on something that Ann said, um, I just pulled up, uh, the Department of Energy has an interesting study showing that um, diesel auxiliary power units can be installed in fire stations and used to power the things on the truck that need power so that you don't have to idle the engines. Um, because you raised the point about having the engines yeah. running, you know, idling basically and doing the emissions. And um, the study seems to indicate you can dramatically lower the amount of emissions and all of that if, if you do the APUs. I can, I can send you the link to that. So maybe if something of that nature gets incorporated into the project, we can address some of the concerns around the, around the emissions in the island. Yes, and, it, and those will be. Uh, we're very pleased, I'll repeat again, the, the architect that we've had has built dozens of stations. And I think I mentioned has, has uh, done one here on, uh, on the uh, Coast here just a little while ago. So, you know, we're, we will make every effort to make sure that both the emissions and the lighting issue are addressed in the EIR. And also, I'm sure that given the experience of the El Granada Station, the county is going to be much more sensitive to that issue as well. Awesome. Let me, let me, excuse me, let me just add one thought that I, uh, if, he, uh, if, if the if I and my peers were looking to build a station and we had a, an open field to do it in and we had all kinds of room and had all kinds of choices as to locations and surrounding uh, cities and citizens and so forth, uh, that would be just wonderful. But that's just you know, dreaming. We just did not have that kind of opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, we looked at uh, all different kinds of areas and just simply did not have anything that that uh, would meet the requirements of having a fire station and uh, we're very fortunate that we're having being able to uh, build this station in the old location and still meet all the requirements and some of the concerns you've mentioned i simply will commit and i'm sure my peers will commit that we will do everything possible to address all the issues that you brought up and resolve it. Gary, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Appreciate you. your responsiveness and thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you very much for your inviting me. Okay. Are there any other uh, members of the community that would like to? Everybody who had their hands up is already spoken. That's funny because, um, uh, Anne, you had your hand up, but it wasn't showing. Oh, no, I'm not online. Oh, okay. I mean, earlier, uh, thought, I thought I understood. I, 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 yeah. no, oh, no, I, I think we heard everything. <laughs> yeah. Some story. Right. So I think I'd like to move on to the next agenda item now. Gary, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you all. We have a member of the Public Health Department, Stella Chow, with us, and I've made her co-host. Oh, and Cynthia was here. Thank you, Cynthia Cheryl. Well, you may know Cynthia. Can I uh, just ask a quick question oh, for you? Of you? Uh, uh, yes. Just regarding this agenda order, I know that Harvey is on and maybe others waiting for, right. why did we reorder that? In order to address time slotting concerns of the presenters and get okay. them, let them do it. Got it. I'm not suggesting this is a new normal. I'm just saying, because I talk to these people, they have small kids, they have other commitments, they have blah, 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 blah. Okay. And as you may remember, our meetings can tend to run late. Okay, I just want to I just want to add one more thing on, on follow up on that note is that um, the community um, tends to expect a certain order. So I understand that there may be once in a while it's been a great while uh, reordering, but I, I just hope that we don't do it, um, you know, without a solid reason. Yeah, so noted. All right, Stella, I can see. Great, you. can you? Yeah, can you hear? Yes. Awesome. 
Thank you so much for reordering for us. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Stella Chow. I'm with San Mateo County Health, Alcohol or uh, Behavior Health Recovery Services, Alcohol and Other Drugs, and I work on prevention side. With me today, I have Mark Ross, who works for Medication Assisted Treatment, and also Mary Fullerton, who is a Clinical Services Manager. We'll be presenting on the fentanyl crisis, what you should know. Having trouble advancing the slide. This is your slide. You try to advance the next one. Well, take your time. Okay. Hmm. So let's see. Sorry, it is. Okay, you did advance. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this is what I'll be presenting, we'll be presenting on today. Reasons why people start using substances, substance use disorder in general, signs and symptoms of drug use, basics about drugs with a focus on opioids and fentanyl, harm reduction, opioid overdoses, treatment options, prevention strategies, youth mental health, and what can you do as a community member? So we wanted to start off with the continuum of care because when we're talking about fentanyl, we're talking about uh, people having substance use disorders. And we also wanted to touch upon some of the other items in this slide here. It largely uh, has to do with mental health and we wanna put that at, at the center. Uh, it is May Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, I work on the prevention side. Um, and we also do some early intervention for youth who have just started using substances, but may not be able to be diagnosed as having a substance use disorder yet. So I'm going to hand it off to Mark. Yeah, it'll, it'll go to me first. Thanks, oh. Stella. So hi, everyone. My name is Mary Taylor Fullerton, and I'm a clinical services manager with Behavioral Health and Recovery Services. And so we just wanted to give a brief overview of why do people use drugs? And so thinking about how many of you picked up a cup of coffee or tea this morning, that's a substance and substance changed the way we feel. And people use drugs for lots of different reasons, largely to change how they feel or because they work. Um, so the common reasons because of stress, anxiety, overwhelm, pain, depression, peer pressure, celebrities, friends doing it, lots of different reasons. And we have trauma in there as well. Stella mentioned the high correlation between co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, which is something at BHRS that we try to focus on a lot. You can uh, advance the next slide, Stella, thank you. While we're pulling up the next slide, there's a British um, writer and author who has a, a TED talk on everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. And he articulates that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection or human connection. And so a lot of what we'll be presenting tonight is from this notion of understanding substance use as a chronic brain disease, um, understanding that substance use is not a moral failing or a personal choice that it is a chronic relapsing condition, uh, disease, brain disease. And with repeated drug use, it can change the brain. And so over time and over the um, course of someone's life, depending on what's happening, um, there are changes that happen in, in an individual's brain. And Mark will talk a little bit later about um, what substances can do to the brain. But the brain changes from addiction, and some of the changes can be lasting. Um, we work with a lot of folks in the county who have been consuming alcohol at high frequencies, high amounts for years and years and years, and there are sometimes permanent and lasting changes. Um, one of the things that we know now, and so you can advance again, one of the things we know now that we didn't know when I started this in this field 25 years ago is that the brain is more plastic, so things like neuroplasticity and the evolution of fMRIs show us that the brain actually can heal, and so neuropathways can change, and with exposure to substance use and the brain disease, with treatment, sometimes medication, that there can be healing and there can be reforming of neuropathways, and um, occasionally we get to uh, take part in that and watch an individual through their recovery process, so there are hopeful uh, measures as well. And so what are the risk factors? 
why might someone become addicted and someone not become addicted? And so I can't emphasize enough that people of any age, any sex, economic status can be addicted to a drug. And so this is not just a disease of individuals of a certain uh, economic class or status or race, um, but this really can affect anybody. But there are certainly factors that can affect the likelihood um, of a developing addiction. And so things like family history of addiction is known to be a risk factor for addiction, mental health disorders, peer pressure, lack of family involvement. So we know that um, when an individual has uh, doesn't, hasn't had support. So things like adverse childhood experiences, if you're familiar with the ACE study, can lead to a higher risk behavior, which can lead to substance use and can develop addiction. Um, early use, so starting use at an earlier age, um, can cause changes in the developing brain and can be a risk factor for use later in life, continued prolonged use and or addiction. And taking a highly addictive drug is also a risk factor. What does it look like when someone's using substances? Um, so these are fairly generalized uh, signs of drug use. Sometimes it's bloodshot eyes, pinpoint pupils, which is kind of the hallmark of opioid use, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, dilated pupils, more for stimulant and psychotropic drugs, uh, sleepy appearance, sluggish, change in motivation, change in personality. Um, it can also be the opposite of some of these things. It could be increased motivation if someone's on a stimulant. Um, uh, substance it can be difficulty fo focusing or distorted sensory perceptions. And you can go to the next slide, different effects. So just looking at um, some of the more common effects, I think you went one too many, Stella. Um, if you could go back one, thanks. Um, we just wanted to highlight some of the short-term and long-term effects of some of the common substances, alcohol, cannabis, and opioids. Um, and so the short-term effects, sometimes they're desirable for folks, um, but they also oftentimes have uh, very, symptoms and signs that are very observable, right? And so, you know, for example, Mark, who you'll hear from in a minute, who's been working in this field for a long time, and you can tell by someone's presentation. Um, and so kind of what, what sense that they might be on or what they might um, be experiencing, especially coming down uh, long-term. So if someone's in um, intoxication versus withdrawal, um, and then long-term use. So I mentioned earlier, we work with a lot of individuals who have um, just decades of uh, al alcohol use. And so we do see quite a few individuals that have neurological damage, which can sometimes uh, appear or present in an irreversible manner. Um, increased risk of cancer, uh, problems, lower IQ, a lot of cognitive impairment as well. And then because we're focusing tonight on fentanyl, the next slide, so we'll focus on um, what are opioids. Because fentanyl is an opioid, as we'll be talking about. You could advance, so the fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, but it is part of a uh, larger class of drugs known as opioids. And why, why do we have opioids? Opioids have been prescribed for a long time. So it's a type of drug that's used to induce pleasure and reduce pain. It can be really helpful if you need to have a surgery um, or you have had something sudden or drastic happen and um, opioids are prescribed and very effective um, working on that pain receptor in the brain. So they first started with codeine and morphine, uh, opium, uh, but the history of opioid use and abuse goes back uh, for a long time. And in the 20th century, we started seeing drug companies, manufacturers experimenting with synthetic or lab made substances, um, similar to those made from opium, opium. Um, and heroin, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and fentanyl were born. Um, we'll talk again more about fentanyl and where it fits into this whole scheme, but it's important to remember that opioids produce a temporary state of euphoria or high, and they are extremely addictive. The more opioids somebody uses, the more tolerance that they develop, meaning that they need a higher level to achieve the same effect. So the brain is actually creating more receptors. So the new receptor in the brain is what the opioid attaches to, and when there's more that happen, the brain just pops up more of those receptors. And so an individual needs more of the substance, more of the opioid to achieve the same effect. And so very powerful substance. And why are we prescribing these substances? I mentioned some of the reasons earlier, including surgical care. Um, it's very commonly used for acute pain relief. Um, it's not recommended that they're long-term uh, use, but um, pain management has uh, historically been associated and struggled with opioid 
prescribing and misuse, abuse, and leading to addiction. Um, so again, it's less common that you see long-term. Um, can be used for suppression of diarrhea, opioid tr uh, use treatment disorders, and suppressing cough, though less common today. And how does it work? I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it, it alters the way a person perceives pain. So the drug attaches to that receptor in the brain, and um, nerve cells send inaccurate messages about the pain severity. So the person feels less pain, so that the body isn't still you know, the bone's still broken, or the body's still experiencing trauma, but the brain is not telling the body you're in pain. And it can affect um, how the brain feels pleasure and uh, feelings of elation. And so because of that disruption in the neurocircuitry, there can be the sense of feeling really good. Um, and there can also be, after that sense of feeling really good, uh, a deep relaxation or sleepiness. And so this is acting on the central nervous system, and it can depress the central nervous system and the next slide, we'll see that there's potential short-term effects of opioids. So there can be major mood swings because of that initial euphoria or high. And because of that central nervous system depressant, there can be slowed breathing, clouded mental functioning, nausea, vomiting, sedation, drowsiness, hypothermia, which is when the body temperature is lower than normal. Um, and then more severe coma and death due to overdose. And so an individual can overdose on opioids um, and that generally is related to that uh, depression of the central nervous system and an individual would go into that um, kind of comatose state and stop breathing. So the next slide we're going to get into fentanyl specifically and I'm going to hand this over to Mark. I see a Mark Ross, but I don't hear anything. That's Mark. Well, let me check in with him. Mark is, um, he's working right now at the, I, I, I'll just speak very briefly about our team. So I manage a team at the San Mateo Medical Center Emergency Department, which is where Mark is. And so he could be um, wrapped up in an emergency at this moment. So. Oh, I think I had the wrong microphone selected. Is it, is it working now? Yeah, we can hear you, Mark. Thanks. Great. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'm Mark Ross. I am a medication assisted treatment case manager and the I and IMAT stands for integrated. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm integrated into the San Mateo medical center emergency department. So I see people here for alcohol or opioid use disorders and link them to treatment. Uh, fentanyl has been um, kind of our biggest thing lately. Um, uh, you can see here by the penny that uh, that dosage is, is a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. And you can see how small it is versus, say, the potentially lethal dose of heroin. Um, so it's a manufactured opioid used for pain management, uh, very strong, highly addictive people inject it. Um, there are medically, there are lozenges and patches. Street users uh, also uh, smoke it on foil uh, or uh, snort. Uh, most fent fentanyl is tasteless, odorless, and colorless, although lately they've been coming out with some that are bright, shiny colors, which is discouraging to see if our young people get a hold of those. Um, it's commonly added to street drugs, and often the user doesn't uh, doesn't even know that it's in there. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, if you have pain medications, um, or you're in pain and you need pain medications, ask for alternative pain treatments if you can. Tylenol, ibuprofen are uh, uh, a lot safer, obviously, and sometimes they, they work just about as well. Uh, if you go to the dentist and they give you some extra hydrocodone, don't keep that stuff in the cabinet. If you've got young ones around, don't keep that in your medicine cabinet um, just in case. Go ahead and get rid of that because you don't want people getting a hold of it. Uh, don't flush it or push it in the, put it in the garbage. Um, there are take back programs, which we'll show in a minute where some of the disposable or disposal uh, sites are. Um, 
So prescription drugs can be dangerous. A lot of people end up starting their opioid addiction from taking uh, prescription pain relievers, uh, whether it's their prescription or somebody else's prescription. Um, those pills are pretty popular on the street, especially uh, kids uh, seem to really get started that way. Um, and then obviously we're trying to put more money into prevention and treatment and then just reducing the stigma, you know, uh, talking about it, uh, educating families, kids, uh, and especially users about the risks of what they're uh, getting involved with. And don't buy drugs off the street or online because you never know what you're going to get. If you order Xanax, you're, you're probably going to end up with fentanyl. Um, so here's some of the drop-off sites. Half Moon Bay has one. There's uh, Rite Aid's, uh, CVS, and the Sheriff's Office. I believe there's a drop box here at the San Mateo Medical Center as well. So harm reduction, uh, that's, that's sort of my, my specialty. A lot of the folks that come in here aren't, aren't necessarily wanting to stop drugs or alcohol entirely, but they are willing to have a conversation about changing their relationship with drugs and alcohol. And so what we try to do is offer a non-judgmental approach to, to, cause any little difference can help. If you think of sunscreen, they know the difference between going out and lying in the sun for two or three hours with sunscreen on versus without, you know, um, uh, obviously you're a lot safer with the sunscreen on. Um, some other examples are the seat belts, speed limits, birth control, um, filters on a cigarette. Uh, we also use uh, languages to try to, so if we scare people off by, by starting the conversation and we use, we, we sound judgmental if we call them an addict or, or, or a drug fiend or something like that, we've lost our opportunity to do an intervention and, and, and we may not get another opportunity. So, uh, we use people language first, like instead of, um, uh, oh, he's a, a meth addict. We'll say, oh, this is a, a, a person with a substance use disorder or a person, uh, addicted to meth, uh, or a person experiencing problematic substance use. Uh, with drug tests, uh, one of the, I, I still hear a lot of people talk about dirty tests. You know, people aren't dirty. Like if they've been using drugs, they're still the same person. They just have a, their urinalysis came out positive. And so we want to be able to talk about that. Your urinalysis came out positive for fentanyl. Are you willing to talk about your fentanyl use today? Uh, next slide, please. I, I see we have a hand up, but I just don't, I don't know the protocol of this meeting to take questions. I, I would like I would like you to finish your presentation, and yes, we definitely will have questions. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. So some other examples of uh, harm reduction are safe consumption sites. Uh, I know those are a little controversial, um, and I don't believe we. Uh, I know we had one in San Francisco for a while. I'm not sure how that's going. A syringe exchange. So if people are going to use IV drugs, try to get them clean needles so that they're not also um, getting infections or spreading uh, contagious diseases like hep, hep C, hep B. Um, we use psychoeducation. Uh, let's see, condoms are another great example of harm reduction. Um, medication assisted treatment by itself. So some, some people might still be using drugs, but instead of heroin, they take uh, Suboxone and then they interact with us regularly um, while they're linked with the clinic getting their Suboxone and it gives us an opportunity to explore maybe ways that they could reduce their other drug use. Uh, we have test strips that we can offer people where they can test their drugs for fentanyl. So if they get some pills off of the street, there are, there are ways you can test those pills to see if they have fentanyl in them. Um, lately, it seems like people are intentionally using fentanyl, which is concerning, uh, versus it used to be kind of an accident, you know, uh, where they want to get something else and, oh my gosh, my meth had fentanyl in it. And now they're just going straight to buy the fentanyl. But, um, 
these these methods are great ways to reduce the harm uh, that comes with use. Uh, in cases of suspected overdose, so having Narcan on hand, we, we, we always recommend people have Narcan to use with somebody so they can administer Narcan if somebody overdoses. Um, and uh, there are distribution programs available to get the Narcan, although they, they seem to be a little overwhelmed right now. Um, but, uh, for example, if you come to an emergency room and they find out that you've been using opioids, they're most likely going to prescribe you Narcan discharge. And uh, we do have access to a bit of it. Uh, we don't have enough to supply a whole community, but, you know, if a parent or something called us here at the ED, uh, we would be willing to provide a box of Narcan just for, for safety. Uh, next slide, please. So opioid overdose. Uh, yeah, people look like they're asleep. Um, uh, a lot of times they'll be snoring. Um, they may uh, turn blue. Skin could be cold or clammy. Um, yeah, in the early stages of it, it just kind of looks like they're dozing off. You see people nodding. Um, these are good opportunities to check in with and make sure that the person is is responsive, make sure they're breathing, see if they're able to speak, check for blueness around the skin, lips, and fingernails. If you think that they might be overdosing, just call 911. If you've got uh, Narcan in your pocket or in your dash of your car or whatever, call 911 first and then administer the Narcan. Um, down at the bottom, it uh, talks about rescue breathing. Uh, do do that if you know how to do that. Uh, if you don't stick with the naloxone, um, it's pretty easy to administer. It's just a, a shot in, in the nostril. Um, a lot of times it'll just perk somebody up uh, right away. If not, you can put a, a shot in the other nostril. It's like a nasal spray, just like you would use if you had a cold. Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, so these pills. Uh, which one of these pills looks like it's fake? Or which ones look like they're real? So the, um, I guess we'll just, we'll just reveal it to you. Uh, the next slide. Every single one of them is counterfeit and laced with fentanyl except for the Adderall. And the Adderall is the one on the, uh, on the left there. So people have pill presses and they take, they, they get the fentanyl in a powdered form and they press it into these pill shapes to make it look like just a regular pill. So it'll, it could even have the brand logo on there. So you think you're getting Valium and really you're getting fentanyl. And it's a safe bet that most of the pills people find on the street are fake at this point. So I'm at, uh, that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, so if you want to get connected with us, uh, a person could just call directly the 573-2735. We've got the bat phone right over here in the ER. We're here from seven in the morning till nine in the evening. Uh, weekend hours are a little shorter, but we are here seven days a week. Um, Primary care doctors can provide MAT these days. Uh, psychiatrists can provide MAT and frequently do for alcohol. For opioids, um, more often uh, you have to go to a specialty clinic because the medication-assisted treatment for those is usually another opioid, which is a controlled substance. Um, let's see here. And there's just some little snippets about, you know, we still, we refer to a lot of other agencies um, within the county, the access line, uh, residential treatment team, um, and a lot of our clients find help in outpatient services as well or 12-step meetings. Um, and there's some links on here that you can use to connect some of those those resources. And there's our cool coasters that we made that we uh, 
we passed out for a while. So, uh, like I said, our our specialty is is alcohol and opioids. And um, yeah, we're here seven days a week at San Mateo Medical Center. We do also have case managers. Uh, we've got one in the field in um, the new navigation center a few days a week. We've got uh, two field-based case managers that can travel around a little bit more. And then we have we will have one soon in the uh, McGuire Jail where they're doing MAT for inmates to try to reduce recidivism. Great, thank you, Mark and Mary. Um, so I'll be talking about the prevention side. Uh, I'm the prevention coordinator for the county. So I want to talk about the most commonly used um, drugs by youth, alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, including vaping, which has been on the rise for several years now. Uh, over-the-counter medications like cough syrup, MDMA, ecstasy. So for your area, um, the California Healthy Kids Survey actually is run in each school district. So this is your data on your youth use in your school district uh, in Cabrillo Unified Secondary. Um, and so we typically use data that is uh, talks about the past 30 day use. That's usually the data that we look most at. And um, you can see from the grade 11 uh, alcohol use is at about 36%, um, binge drinking 24%, cannabis 25%. Um, prescription drugs um, is 3% and other drugs, pills or medicine to get high is at 2%. And we may need a little bit more detailed data too to see, to hone in on um, specific pills too. It's, it's a little bit vague there. Um, but I wanted to give you uh, data on the sample size below the grade 11. Um, it was about uh, 238 youth who were uh, uh, replied to the survey and I think they had to throw out um, some of the surveys because it was incomplete. Um, so that's the data there. Non-traditional schools is on the right side. It does not have the data for the non-traditional schools, but you can pull up every school district's data on the um, citation below. Um, so for AOD youth prevention programming, we do programming for youth before they start the initiation of substance use. So we do um, AOD education presentations throughout the entire county. We have seven contractors working on that. We do so social media campaigns, which is a really big way in how youth are, you know, their youth culture. Um, they're on their phones a lot. Um, and we actually push out ads on their phones um, in specific um uh, uh, platforms um, in our areas. Um, we run youth groups throughout the county. We promote safe disposal sites like you saw in earlier slide. Uh, we also promote policy work. Um, what is the school district's policy on um, finding a youth who may be using a substance at school? Are they Do they have an alternative to suspension program or are youth going to be suspended or going to be transferred to a continuation school? Um, let's have conversations that, um, you know, are, are serving our youth in a holistic way and addressing those issues and why they started using in the first place. Um, and then also brief intervention, we have funded and we will be funding more in the future uh, intervention programs like alternative to suspension programs, working with schools and school districts for that. And I hope to see much more of that in the future. So youth mental health, um, to give a synopsis, not to go through all of it, um, the youth mental health um, rates for uh, things like depression, loneliness, connectedness, um, there's a, uh, some, some groups have called it a mental health crisis for children and youth, um, especially mm -hmm. since the pandemic had started um, and even before then too. Um, the rates of depression have been slowly rising for the last 10 years. And um, the Surgeon General's report in 2021 um, highlighted uh, us needing to pay more attention to youth and uh, children me mental health. Uh, Surgeon General just released a report on loneliness 
And then Surgeon General actually just this week reported, uh, had a special report on youth and um, the harms of using social media. So right now is a really pivotal time to wrap our youth uh, with services, support, um, and having those co conversations with youth um, about what's going on in their lives on a daily basis. So what can you do? As a youth, you can have a trusted friend network, um, learn clear and refusal skills, um, leave an unsafe situation when you're having a gut feeling that just doesn't feel right, um, as exit the situation. Um, talk with others about how you are feeling. Find a trusted adult for support and help. Don't use substances alone. Educate yourself with the facts and accurate information and find those accurate sources online too. There's a lot of misinformation out there. What can you do as parents? Um, really, you know, accepting children and, and youth for who they are and who, not who they, you, you want them to be. Um, communicate expectations and boundaries that are clear and hold your children accountable for them. Know their friends and their parents. Who are they hanging out with? And have you had conversations with their parents? Know who they're with um, really at, at all times and, and how to get a hold of them. Keep talking and listening to your youth, sometimes more listening. Um, assure them that their feelings are, are natural, that uh, most people go through those feelings. Be there for them. And know the signs and symptoms of possible mental health challenges and drug use and get help if it's, it's needed. Be proactive and get help early. What can you do if you're in schools? Uh, create a safe environment for learning. Consider the physical, social, and emotional needs of students along with their academic needs. Facilitate on-site provision, provision of services when possible. Review discipline policies and practices. Um, and, you know, we've seen that different school districts really have, um, they seem to have different uh, practices for how they handle suspensions. Um, and, um, yeah, um, ensure that your school has naloxone um, available. Uh, and we've seen that in schools. And that's um, the end of mine. Do you want to talk a little bit more about this mirror year, Mark? Yeah, sure. So this is just a slide for the San Mateo County in order to access help for individuals who have Medi-Cal um, or are undocumented or uninsured and need to seek treatment or help for mental health or substance use disorders can call uh, our VHRS Access Call Center at the number here on the screen. The phones are answered 24 hours a day. The connections to services generally happens during business hours. So oftentimes information is relayed, received, and then um, a clinician calls back during business hours to get more information. Um, but they are answered 24 hours a day. So that concludes okay. our presentation. Uh, if you'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah, I, I do. I just want to make a friendly comment. Uh, I, I first want to appreciate the three of you for taking the time to come. I know that the last few years have been very challenging for public health professionals, um, but uh, hopefully we're past that crisis and we're on to the next one, which is an old one that we've seen before. Um, I'd like to take questions from the public first, beginning with Jill Grant. She was the one who brought this up last December, I think, Jill. Um, when you were on the MCC. So uh, we've been waiting a long time to, to hear what the county is doing about this. Jill, what did you want to ask or comment? I know she's there, her hand is up. Oops, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I hear you. Okay, thanks, Greg, and um, thank you, Mary, Mark, and Stella for coming tonight. It's great that you took the time to explain all that to us. Um, I had uh, the pleasure of going to a Half Moon Bay High School uh, fentanyl uh, presentation on May 10th of this year, um, and unfortunately, it was not well attended. 
there were two parents, myself and my husband, and three school staff and four police uh, sheriffs. So um, if we do that again, I hope there'll be more people there. But uh, it was very informative. Two, the two officers who were presenting were undercover sheriffs, and they gave us a nice rundown on what's going on with, um, uh, you know, trying to circumvent drugs from entering the country and being distributed. <clears throat> and that was great. Um, they went over some, some of the things that you just went over. Um, one of the things they, they covered you didn't, they said uh, fentanyl is the number one death in the United States for 18 to 43 year olds. Is that correct? So it, when, you, when you look at the, when you look at national data, so drug overdose have continued to increase year upon year. So drug overdose deaths have continued to increase year upon year. The start of the pandemic in 2020 saw the highest ever recorded drug overdose deaths which was at that time 107,000. I think the numbers for 2021, they haven't fully calculated 2022, but are like 110,000 drug overdose deaths. And the breakdown is um, roughly 53. So just over half were attributed to synthetic opioids because of the way that some coroner's offices and labs test or don't test all the various analogs of fentanyl because of the way it's manufactured and distributed. Um, that specific statistic, I would say, is, is it, it's harder to quantify, but nationally, yes, that more than half of the drug-related overdose deaths are attributed to synthetic opioids or defense. Okay. Um, they also shared that in San Mateo County, um, there was, we had one of the highest death rates in California, in our county, 120 deaths, and I think that was uh, 2022, and over 500 overdoses that were circumvented with Narcan or with EMT help, and many, uh, and those are just the ones we know of because they also relate that many, uh, there's such a stigma that many parents who have a child, a teenager who has an overdose, they don't report it. Right. And unfortunately, there was one in early May of this year at Half Moon Bay High School, a teenager overdosed and was revived, but it was not reported. <clears throat> the parents didn't want it reported. School had no idea that it that this occurred until this presentation. Um, yeah. My so my daughter is at Half Moon Bay High School, and she's 18. She's president of the Safe Space Club, and she's very much in the know of what's going on at that school. And she was introduced to drugs uh, as soon as she entered the high school. As soon as you enter that high school, there are dealers that are poaching on kids, and they are in schools. And you can get anything at that high school. Um, I mean, recently there were kids doing cocaine, so you can get anything you want. And we, we don't have any of these tools for these kids. We don't have fentanyl testing strips like in other Bay Area counties, and we don't have Narcan. Um, and there's such a stigma in this county that people won't even show up to presentations to learn about it. And I just wanna, I just wanna know what can you do to help educate the youth directly and get these tools into the parents' hands or the kids' hands? Because I don't want a dead teenager, you know, at Half Moon Bay High School. But you take a lot packed into that. Um, to Just what? What is okay. going can on? I, can, I, can I come back? So I want I want to take each piece sure. of what you said as, as best as I can remember, and I may have to ask you again to to refresh your memory. Um, but so one, just around the death statistics in San Mateo County, I don't know where the sheriff is getting that specific information, but our numbers are not really pale in comparison compared to San Francisco and San Jose. So our overdose death numbers are not equivalent to San Francisco, San Jose. And then if you go rural and you look at Central California and San Diego, it's it's not comparable. Um, and so what is what has shifted since 2017 is San Mateo County Public Health and Epidemiology have um, 
more for the contractor, a, a epidemiologist staff who has been really scouring our data and looking through coroner's reports and talk screens and where something may have been categorized as cardiac arrest. And then you go into a tox report and you see if there's methamphetamine, you see there's fentanyl, you see there's other substances, how things get categorized as an overdose death also impacts numbers. So a lot of people get these types of data from the um, California Health Dashboard. So there's a, a, a opioid overdose dashboard that details information per county, per uh, race and ethnicity demographic, per region. And some of that data doesn't, because it's based on what's what the data is put in, exactly like you're saying, Jill, because of we typically only see the, the, the tip of the iceberg. So the data that's mostly widely available doesn't really capture the full uh, picture of what is going on. Um, but I just wanted to address that piece with, with the death. So that's not to minimize or to say that um, we don't have a problem in San Mateo County. I think as Mark alluded to when we started, Great. I, I should share, I've been employed by the county 15 years. I've been a coastside resident myself for 18 years. And so I'm very familiar with what, um, what issues exist in Kaplan Bay. Um, and the coast side. So I think it is definitely known. And there were times where we, we would hear this at the San Mateo Medical Center that people would come to the coast to get the best heroin. I mean, so this is, and this is 10 years ago or so, but we knew where there were pockets and where, you know, kids were being, um, uh, where dealers were. And so, you know, what are, what have folks done? I think is another piece of your question. Um, I think the, the county has invested in different pockets of education. So Stella works with prevention. And so the work with the, the prevention collaboratives is one um, aspect that I think has tried to raise awareness and partnership and collaboration. You know, my team, for example, um, we, under the opioid settlement funds that the San Mateo County just received, we were able to add two or three new positions, which as Mark said, so we're just starting to do a bit more field outreach um, work with correctional health uh, for folks who are experiencing uh, incarceration and folks experiencing homelessness. And so we do have a bit more um, availability to really be in the community because we know that making resources available, um, I'm trying to go through your, your list here of what you talked about, making resources available, Mark talked about harm reduction, being where somebody is and being able to have the right tools at the right time. So not just naloxone, but you mentioned fentanyl test strips. So we we stock those by the thousands sincerely and um and we just we hand them out like you know it's a flyer on the street so we are very happy to supply fentanyl test strips to the school or whomever um asks for, would like them i will say that in the past we have had issues with um organizations being willing to accept based on certain protocols that they have so we ran into this uh, in part of the coast but also with jefferson Union districts and uh, up in Daly City, where a school nurse wanted to stop naloxone. So this is two and a half years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, through maybe three years ago, and there wasn't a process or protocol, and there was some pushback around um, in some different school districts, not on the coast side, but around are we as school nurses or as school administrators able to stop naloxone? So there's actually there's a whole protocol for it. There's a national um, protocol that looks at how to do naloxone. So uh, brand name being Narcan, that's the overdose reversal medicine Mark's talking about. Um, and, you know, we've been ordering it for free from the state, like any library, school, church, entity, anybody who works or might interact with an individual who could be at risk of overdose can order from the state of California, the Department of Public Health for free. And that's what we've been doing for eight years. So we, we keep our Narcan supply as fresh as we can. Mark mentioned the supply chain difficulties. There's a couple Thank pieces of legislation of folks who are trying to um narcan kind of has the corner on the market with naloxone right now so there's some state legislation that's been introduced to try to increase so that other brands can come into the market so that the naloxone distribution project can supply more than just narcan but they can supply other types of naloxone so that would help increase supply chain so we've done some advocacy and the county signed on to a bill to support that um the one thing that changed that impacts the coast side as well is as of January 2023, I helped work with the San Mateo County Office of Education on a naloxone toolkit. And so it's actually now a protocol in San Mateo County. We, we worked on this all last year 
got it through multiple committees and boards and sign-offs to start effective January 2023 that all school districts in San Mateo County have to have naloxone on site and have to have a protocol for using it, um, for doing training for staff so staff know how to um, do it. We've been doing some on-the-fly training as well. So, for example, there's a child who, um, this is over the hill and I forget which school district, but there's a child who uh, was appearing to have an overdose, but was on the football field. And the teacher, thankfully, had just had their lost one training and thought, oh my God, I don't have it with me. So what would I have done? The child was six, the child was fine. They weren't um, having an opioid overdose, but the teacher was very concerned. And so we actually flipped and revised the protocol to make sure that when students are in groups or in athletic facilities or things like that, that naloxone is widespread. So it's been a bit of an evolving process, but that has changed. And so Cabrillo Unified is part of San Mateo County District and is required to have naloxone on site and follow the toolkit. It's it's online. You can Google the, the uh, whole toolkit. It's it's actually, I think it's they, they did a really nice job with it. Right. Does that touch on, Jill, most of what you brought up? I'm so glad you had these questions. Well, uh, I don't want to monopolize your time, and I'm very appreciative of you, especially Mary. I've talked to you on the phone. You're wonderful, wonderful, and uh, and keep doing what you're doing. But how do we get these tools into the hands of kids and parents? I mean, uh, we like you can go over to Berkeley, which I did recently, and I went to a bookstore, and there was right on a little shelf. There's test kits. There's naloxone. There's resource brochures, you know, and, you know, I was sitting there reading all the stuff. It was great. Um, so I, I have, a, I mean, a, I guess kind of a very timely um, piece to that. What can we do, right? So raising awareness is huge. Um, this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the day after Memorial Day, the May 30th, uh, myself and a few, our medical director and public health officer and um, the county of office education assistant superintendent are going to be presenting to the board, the county board of supervisors. So they requested a study session on fentanyl. Um, we were actually supposed to do it end of April, but something else had happened um, at that uh, board meeting on the, on the 26th. And so we got bumps to the 30th. And so there will be time for public comment. Um, we do have a set of recommendations that we've been making to the board, which include things, uh, I think the number one recommendation is a widespread community outreach program because, you know, I mean, you've all been very gracious and wonderful inviting us here and to have attention and, and concern about this, but, you know, Mark's literally on shift right now. <laughs> so he's like, like a nurse and doctor could walk in his office at any moment and say, I have a patient, come see this guy in trauma hall too. Right. I mean, Stella and I both have small children. And so we're, you know, we are, um, my job is not community outreach and education. I wish it was. I, I love this type of work. Um, we started the Cabrillo Unify, the talk on fentanyl uh, two years ago uh, on the coast. And, um, you know, did a parent outreach night just from a connection I have on the coast side and someone that was interested in doing it. And so we have done a few, uh, kind of about opioids and about substances in health education classes um, in conjunction with a science teacher at, um, at the middle school at Cunha and a couple like in services in classes at the high school. Um, but it, it's, you know, really squeezed in where the teachers are able to squeeze it in. And it very often is somebody on top of the job they're already doing on top of Mark's caseload of 60 patients. He's supposed to be following continuously on top of him you know, Stella's monster responsibility of coalitions across the entire county. We are here tonight talking about this with you all because we are passionate about it. And and we also can't be in every council meeting. We were just at City Council of uh, Brisbane, I don't know, what, a month ago or whenever that was. But these requests are popping up. We sincerely are trying to fulfill them wherever we can because we believe that this messaging is so important. Um, you may have seen the billboard on 101, if we all travel over the hill very often. There's one I heard, someone said they saw it on the northern part of the county, the one that I frequently see is by Redwood City on um, fentanyl awareness. And so it's it's called Fast Facts or Fentanyl Facts. Well, um, let me just interject something here. Thank um, you. The FCC is going to be participating in an emergency preparedness day down in Half Moon Bay on June 10th. Um, and so one question is, is anybody from public health going to be attending that? Or 
Can you supply us at the MCC with materials that we can hand out at our booth to increase education and awareness? Because to me, this is sort of an emergency preparedness thing. And I will send you a follow-up email about that so you can Please get do. back to us. I, I don't know what your staffing load is as, as you're explaining. I wanted to uh, turn to one other question uh, from the public. We have Sid Young. Thank you. Um, Mark, this question's for you because I, you said there were all these fake pills and I guess I, being 71, don't really follow much on this fentanyl stuff. I thought it was like a alternative to heroin and it was something that people were taking intravenously. And I didn't know that people could slip it into other kinds of pills. But I did read in the newspaper about a nanny playing at the Marina Green with her little charge a little kid and they they picked it up out of the grass and started feeling funny i assumed that was a powder form but i mean i'm so completely in the dark about all this stuff and hope to remain so but you know i don't have kids i don't have kids running around my house or anything but is the people that i thought were taking it were you said oh the other thing i wanted to ask was you mentioned that some people are actually searching for it now in other words that's their drug of choice as opposed to having it stuck into some other pill they thought they were buying so maybe you could just go on a little bit about that those we lost just said the she muted herself no, I said just... maybe you could go on about those questions, and then I said thanks. Sorry, I hit mute too fast. Uh, no problem. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the the fentanyl is, you know, um, I think I think the it's easy to get, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's really potent. And so, um, you know, if you've only got a few bucks to spend and you really want to be intoxicated, then fentanyl is desirable for a lot of people, even though they know that there's, you know, a risk that comes with it. Um, people kind of, uh, I guess, accept, accept the risk, sort of take their chances. Um, but, you know, I've, I've seen people overdose on like 10 bucks worth. Um, if you're a regular user, you know, you could use a hundred dollars worth of heroin a day, or you could use 10 bucks worth of fentanyl and get the same result. And I think that's why it's getting to be so popular now. Are they both intravenous or am I wrong about that? Uh, they do it the same way as they do heroin. So I, th I think the majority of people I run into are, are smoking it like on a uh, foil, mm -hmm. um, but they they snort it, they uh, smoke it, and uh, they use it intravenously. So the, the kid that I'm sorry, the kid that um, discovered it at the Marina Green was that a powder form? Then did you, well, did you hear about that? No, I haven't heard about that specific okay. story. All right, never mind no, then. Thank did you. Did you want to come, come back, or was this your hand up from the board? Why don't you go to the council? All right, let's go to the council. I, I have something to say, but I'm going to wait for the rest of you to speak. Ann? So, uh, a few questions. One was, I think I heard that Narcan was going to be made over the counter, or it's supposed to be over the counter in California, and do you know when that will happen so people can access it? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think we, we haven't seen it yet. Um, I think they were in a kind of a pricing conversation. I think the pricing is going to be set about $80. So there's a lot of concerns with it being over the counter. Um, HHS pushed for that. It's a good step, but it will still be, I believe in most pharmacies behind a locked glass. Um, and so there, there's still deterrence to it. So if you have $80 and you want to go spend $80, you can still get a, a provider can give you a prescription. It could be covered for free with insurance. Um, but it's not something that I think people in a harm reduction capacity are very excited about only because um, 
in order to actually have stock naloxone in, in a meaningful way and distribute in a meaningful way, charging $80 and making it very inaccessible is not the best way to do it. Um, so there's a lot of advocacy for continuing to, to support programs. People are concerned it's going to take away from like the naloxone distribution program that, that this, many states have, California's had for the last eight years. Um, they're concerned that that's going to take supply chains away because pharmacies will pay more and can charge more versus giving it to free. It's like there are libraries who've just, you know, been ordering boxes of naloxone for free for a long time. And people are concerned about supply chains with over the counter. So it, it is a good step and that people can go purchase a dose or two and have it for their personal use or family or that they might be concerned about. Um, but it hasn't happened just yet. And then my second comment or is it something that I think the council can do is, and even parents, first I'll start with the parents and say as far as social media, I think it's really important for parents to really monitor what their children are doing and particularly at young ages. I think getting the younger, so many younger children are already on social media. You see parents reach for a phone and give the child a phone just to quiet them down. And I think it's really important that we educate parents to monitor what their children are doing, not allow their children on social media at a young age because it affects girls in particular uh, with so many uh, mental health disorders. And also, I think even as a parent, I think it was very important to not use it too much yourself. You know, be an advocate for your child to not be on social media. And finally, I think as a council, it's something we can do is to help make sure that the county and schools are funding after school programs and keeping our children engaged uh, in the arts, in sports, and making sure that they have access to programs so that they're not having so much time on social media and an opportunity to be engaging in, in this kind of behavior. So that's just an aside. Okay, any other council questions or comments? Sure. Gus? Yeah, first, I just want to say I appreciate the work that you guys are doing, trying to you know, educate the community and, and work in prevention in what is obviously a very huge and somewhat intractable problem. Um, I, my business is private tutoring, so I work with um, queens and teens all day long, seven days a week. Um, and I can tell you, as I do a lot of test prep, kids all the time ask me, should I take a Adderall before I go and take the SAT to just to help me focus? And um, I always ask them, do you have a prescription for that? And inevitably they say no, but I can, I can get one, no problem. Like it's, the kids all can get Adderall, that kind of thing. Like it's, it's, they all know who to go to. Um, it doesn't matter, like it's not just Half Moon Bay, like it's any of the high schools around here. Um, you know, and I, I think in the end, I think um, we, we as a society face, like the reason we have sort of a, a large societal drug problem so we have a lot of large societal loneliness and disconnection problem that um, is driving people to drugs that I we're just uh, it's just triage until we figure out the, the loneliness disconnection thing but um, but I really appreciate you guys are in the trenches doing the triage um, and so I thank you for that yeah you know right, just raise your hand all right just, just say no to drugs didn't work this is your brain on drugs didn't work. So I hope what you're doing works someday. So everything we've done in the past didn't do anything. Well, I have one more tangible thing that could be done. And I'm just going to tell a little story here. Back in 2001, late 2000, we founded a company to help pharmaceutical companies get the word out about cost, safety, and efficacy of their drugs ethically. A new computer system, kind of like Facebook, only we would find the doctors for you the ones that were influential in their field, and let you send your medical science liaisons to them. Our first client was Purdue Pharma. In the course of working with Purdue Pharma, we discovered, because we were doing what these days would be called internet surveillance, that there was an opioid epidemic in the country, and it was called hillbilly heroin in Tennessee and West Virginia. And so on February 12, 2002, we spoke before Senator Kennedy and Murray and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and we said, there's an opioid epidemic in this country. Nobody's looking at it. It's right here on the internet. You have enough information to file adverse event reports. The FDA didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want another drug recall. Purdue Pharma didn't want to hear about it. They were making billions, right? And 
nobody at the government did anything. The Association for Health Research Quality didn't do anything. And 16 years later, I'm reading headlines about tens of thousands of opioid overdoses. Now, of course, Purdue Pharma fired, a, fired us that month, and the head of medical education and affairs at Purdue quit and came to work for us, right? And our company did fine on its own without Purdue Pharma. But we now have the opportunity to test wastewater. We did it during the pandemic, and I believe it was successful. It's being done at SAM. SAM had a proposal to test the wastewater for dangerous substances, including, drum roll please, fentanyl. Okay, the cost is a few hundred bucks, I think, a test, all right? I think the test would be done a couple of times a month, um, and happily they refused to agree to pay for it, and from a fiduciary point of view, they're within their rights to say it's not a primary function of the wastewater authority to be testing for dangerous substances, even though there was no objection we did for COVID. So my question, and it may not be for you, Mary, it may be for people layers above you. I don't want to go through the same thing that happened when we testified for the Senate, and we didn't use the early morning technology we had at the time. We now have an early morning technology that can test the wastewater. So why aren't we doing that in the county? What is the position of public health? And if you're not the person to answer this question, I understand. Get back to me, please, because it's going to drive me crazy to see hundred thousands of deaths on this, just like we have with opioid overdoses, because we didn't use early warning technology to at least identify what locations they have. It. We're hearing that teenage drug dealers at, at the high school. This is driving me nuts. All right, so should we bring this back again for another time? Because we're we're running over. I, I'd like to answer the question, Dan. I've given you plenty of time tonight. I want to hear an answer to this question if she has. I thought you said she wasn't the one. I don't know. She's going to tell so me. We just, I, I believe this came up in some of the email exchanges about this presentation previously, and it was directed to Mark Newman, who is our um, in our public health policy and planning, who would be doing this. So uh, myself, Stella, and Mark are in behavioral health and recovery services. So we work uh, more on the prevention and treatment side of substance use and mental health. So what you're talking about, um, and there are other rumblings and advocacy for this across the nation and so you're certainly not alone in recognizing like hey we've seen how this works why are we not doing it um and so that would be a question for public health policy and planning and i believe i think greg can correct me if i'm wrong but i think there was some email exchange about that previously. right right yeah. okay so it's mark i should go, i should go to mark yeah uh-huh yeah okay. all right um, and, or, and or bring it up with the board of supervisors next tuesday that is a good idea Okay. And then we will be in touch about getting material for uh, the emergency preparedness. Um, we we can supply you with fentanyl test strips with a small supply of naloxone. We can supply you with information about our, our team at the medical center um, because we do have Marcet, a field based person who can. We have, like, in working with ALAS and um, El Centro de Libertad and some of the schools. We've had case managers that are bilingual, bicultural, come to the coast and meet with families that were concerned about children. Um, and so that could happen by calling the number that Mark mentioned. So we can supply you with that information that if, if we can't have somebody there on the staff. Okay. I also got a copy of your presentation from Stella earlier in draft form. Can I post that or do you want to send us another copy uh, so that these phone numbers and contact information is publicly available on our website? I'll let Stella decide that. Yeah, I'll send you an updated copy of the presentation uh, tomorrow morning. All right. Well, we, we do appreciate you taking the time. Uh, obviously, we think what you do is important. Um, thank you for your attempts to improve our public health. Uh, Greg, Fran has her hand up still in case she has a question. Uh, I noticed that, but we had already stopped taking comments from the public, and we already had a council member who wanted to advance the agenda, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and, and terminate this this portion of the agenda. Thank you all. Um, Thanks, folks. Thank, thank right. you. Thank you. Keep thank up the you. Group. All right. So on the agenda, the next item would be our old favorite reports from other government agencies, board supervisors, and so forth. Harvey, I see you're still here. Did you want to give a report? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, I was fascinated to hear about the fentanyl crisis. So. Uh, I learned a lot, and I'm grateful for the MCC uh, for presenting it. Uh, just a small correction for what Greg said. Uh, at the SAM meeting, when uh, the ability to test wastewater for fentanyl was brought up, we were all in favor of it, 
we just thought that either the sheriff's uh, office or the county should pay for it. It's not really a uh, a wastewater issue, and I'm hopeful that we'll get support from either the or both the sheriff and the uh, uh, county. Uh, I have a short report, a few things that uh, I think are relevant to the mid coast. Uh, we had a farm worker summit last Saturday, uh, well attended at the Boys and Girls Club on Kelly Avenue. Uh, we had legislators there who were uh, very interested in trying to promote some of the uh, laws that will help farm workers uh, get unemployment insurance, uh, medical care, um, make sure their housing conditions are better than they've been. Uh, also, we are concerned about trying to build some farm worker housing on the coast. Uh, it's as everyone says, it's a long slog, uh, but there is a, a proposal, as I mentioned before, at 555 Kelly uh, that would provide 40 units of senior farm worker housing. And uh, we are actively pursuing a project at 880 Stone Pine, where the uh, courtyard right now is uh, being built. Uh, that could uh, have mobile homes uh, for farm workers. Uh, that could be done in a year or two. Uh, we're looking for money for uh, from the state, from the feds. Uh, the county has already committed uh, $1 million toward that project. Um, so we're, we're trying to do what we can to help the farm worker community that has been the the backbone of the entire coast side. Uh, something that's not directly city related, but is of interest, I believe, to the mid coast. Amerigas has decided that it's not worth keeping the propane farm that uh, exists next to uh, the uh, Pillar Ridge uh, mobile home park. Uh, that's been a, a, a thorn in the side of uh, environmentalists for a long time now, but they've at long last decided to uh, sell the land, get rid of the dangerous propane uh, that's right underneath where the uh, airplanes uh, take off and land near the Half Moon Bay Airport. Um, as Greg mentioned, uh, June 10th from 12 to 4, uh, we're going to have a, an emergency preparedness fair, uh, lots of uh, good um, activities there. It's going to be a family friendly thing. Um, we're working hard on getting many organizations, including the MCC, uh, involved in, in showing what they can do to help uh, deal with any emergencies that will occur. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions for Harvey. Seeing none, Harvey, I hope you like this hat better. It's a Sam hat. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, yeah, this, this is acceptable. All right, wait a minute, Jill, you had a question for Harvey. I do, I do. Um, hi, Harvey, thanks for Hello. coming tonight, waiting this out. Um, I, have, I have a complaint, as usual. So um, the Harbor RV Park, there's construction going on now. And I, I know that we were promised that after construction was complete, that the lights in the RV park would come into compliance and have shields placed on them or, or be revamped, I'm not sure. Um, so I wanna know when construction will end and when those lights will be dimmed because they're right in the view corridor. And I also want to know uh, why they have a new flag right in the view corridor that says RV Park. That just seems like it shouldn't be there. Can you answer that for me? No, <laughs> not not that I wouldn't like to. I I, I just don't. Understand. I will get back to you, Jill. Okay. 
and also the trees. They promised they were going to cut the trees to see the view corridor. So we're, we're wondering when that'll happen. Thanks, Harvey. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other public officials. I didn't see Chris Malone hearing them. Um, we'll move to the consent agenda. Uh, uh, board supervisor? Board I just, I just, oh, you Mike. Oh, there he is in person. Mike O'Neill. You want to give us a report? Yes. I didn't see a hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If you can't see me, you might need to advise. Yes, I do. Um, um, so we we were here last Wednesday when we Ray and I and we got here and Greg forwarded the uh, slides to us. So I started putting the list together and trying to figure out who's responsible for what. Um, this week we had a meeting down in Woodside regarding the numerous roads that have been, that are closed, and apparent and Caltrans indicated that they think 84 is not going to be open till October because then there's and there's some a lot of issues because I guess like 7,000 people a day use that road. So there's that, that, and then there's another road down there, th down there that's also close. I think it was Stage Road, I think it was. And, and, yeah, Old Stage Road. And yeah. Piers was close. Yeah, yeah. So th that's where Public Works has really put a focus on the county roads. Caltrans is doing 84, okay, because that's a state highway. Um, and we are having a problem with, despite the fact that the thing is slid down, collapsed and everything else, the signs say, bikers, please don't go down here. They are driving on the road. So that is posing a danger, which they're going to try to figure out how to stop bikers from driving on roads that are closed and with mudslides, et cetera, for their own safety. Um, tomorrow, we are doing a walkthrough at on uh, 2nd Street to look at stormwater in Montera. There's going to be about three or four or five people there, I know. So we're going to be doing that tomorrow. And I doubt we'll have a report back yet, but um, we'll see. They, they've already contributed to the report we're preparing. We, we, okay. We'll have plenty of material from them. Yeah, yeah. But we're actually going to be walking the streets. I get it. Because I enjoy yourself. Yeah, well, I actually asked, do we have a specific address? And they said that, well, the street, I guess, is only two blocks long, so it won't be real hard to find. Right. You know. It's correct. Yeah. So, anyhow, um, pretty much, is there any questions from anybody? Yeah, we do have some questions uh, from the public. And then I, I see some nervous council members, so we'll have questions from the council also. So, uh, Steve Picucci, I think you had your hand up first. Actually, I, I had my hand up for the oncoming public comment, so I'll withdraw my hand. Oh, okay. That was for public comment. These are questions <laughs> the Board of Supervisors, uh, Mike O'Neill representing. Uh, Sid Young, again. Yes, Mike. Um, I know you probably don't have an answer for this, but maybe you could have somebody from May's office check into it. Um, I had to go to a funeral up at Skylon. I usually have been avoiding 92 since the sinkhole was discovered, but I did have to go up there. So I was driving up the road and the cones blocking the passing lane or the uphill two lanes. It's down to one lane all the way up from Santa street farm. If you're familiar all the way up to where the sinkhole is. And I got up there and there's not a single Caltran worker in sight. So why are they leaving the cones all the way up the hill when there's no need? It seems crazy. Um, and why aren't they working on finishing up the problem with the sinkhole so they can change the lanes back to the normal thing? Do you happen to know? No, because 92 is a state highway and that is Caltrans. I would check their website because they have said that they're doing a lot of communication through their website. So I would maybe talk to, you know, check out the Caltrans website and if they have videos I know of 84 on there. And okay. I, I would just assume there, but apparently there's, there is a way, 
if, if you don't get an answer, let me know. And okay. I will take and get the name of the woman that's like the representative for Caltrans for communication in this area. Okay. Line. I just thought if it's going to be like that for the whole summer, you know, it's going to get bad. When we came back from the funeral, it took 40 minutes just to get to Half Moon Bay from Skyline or Skyline Cemetery. Thank you. Hey, hey, Sid. Um, so I'm, I'm on the Transportation Authorities Council, and I actually asked about 92. And, um, oh, good. And they, said, they said it's it's going to be until September. It wasn't supposed to be, but every time it rains, like all their stuff has to dry out, blah, blah, blah. It like, keeps pushing it back. So okay. they like, assume it is going to be like this until September. Okay. Thanks, Gus. Because <laughs> actually they are running into supply issues because the entire state was hit with all this rain. So there's all, you know, up and down the state. And fortunately, they had whatever they needed locally for 90, for 84. So that's okay. the side. All right, uh, we have a question from Burnett Silveria. I think I know what he's gonna ask you. Yeah, I was gonna ask about the, uh, you were saying you're gonna go down and take a look at the stormwater on 2nd Street down in Montera. Is there any plans to come look at the stormwater in El Granada, particularly? down Santa Maria, I've sent you previous information to give you somewhat of an understanding of the problems we're having here from the runoff, excuse me, from uh, Quarry Park. And if you, is something scheduled, great. If not, how about getting something scheduled for us up here in El Granada? I will take and bring that back to see about getting that scheduled. For, for that, I don't know of any issue, you know what I mean? I don't know of any He's scheduled right now, but I'll bring it back. Bernard Burnett has been a leader in documenting the problems in Cordy Park and has been writing with some questions about this since last year. So okay. you might have missed some of this, but uh, you can go forward Second Street. Um, okay, uh, now for the council. Uh, There's one more. Claire, oh. Claire has her hand up. Yeah. She's a council member. Oh. Claire, you wanted to ask Mike? Uh, you're muted, Claire. I got to unmute myself. And I was going to take my hand down, but since you called on me, I put it in the chat. I, as I understand it, the depth of the repair on 92 requires that they cure it for a while before they can add more to the, to the layers of repair that have to take place. So I, I, I agree with what, what Gus was saying, basically. Yeah, there's a physics, Thank you, issue, physics issue with concrete. You, you, know, you can't pour it too, too deep. Um, all right, so going around the council. Um, Scott, so what exactly are problems are bikers causing on Old Stage Road? The road has collapsed. The road has had mudslides. They're ignoring the signs that say, don't go down this road, road closed, and driving through it. So but my, my question is, what problems is that causing? I understand that they're going there, on a road that some, At some point, someone might prove the Darwin theory, you know that they're going to go over the side. But it's not causing any problem to the road or anything like that. Or the well, you know, all the depends what time to do there. There are workers working there. There's also people with heavy equipment there, bulldozers, etc. And if the biker just shows up out of nowhere, right? It causes an accident with heavy equipment, which is tough to respond in yeah. a quick time. And so, so, so the road's closed for construction. The road is closed for construction and common sense. So, no. <laughs> it's a here. Well, I'm sorry. There's no excuse when the road is closed that you should be driving I, down the I, road. I understand. Well, I'm not saying I'm a biker. I'm just speaking in general. But um, and you do know that barriers on Hayden's Piers have been removed by the local people that live there. Again, I. So they're driving cars on. I know there there was people complaining about the no parking, but the reason there was no parking signs on Higgins for SEMA was because that side of the road was collapsing during the, during the, so, there, there so are, you could park your car, come back, and it might have gone down. Well, it's, it's, the road's closed, but people have removed the barriers. And I can't know. stop that. I, you know, okay. so, I, you know, right. Next council the first. county can only do the best they can. And if people want to ignore signs that say danger road closed, that's their prerogative. Okay. Kimberly? But you, the taxpayer, will be paying for the rescue efforts. Kimberly? My question is, um, with all due respect, 
with all due respect to the chair, I thought we were going to hold the slides until we had a chance to discuss. And Mike just said that you gave him the slides from the last presentation. No, we said we were going to give him the list that he didn't have to do the list. Okay, we were going to come back, and that's on the agenda. Okay, so so Mike, the end. Of I got it, and I just wanted to get a head start because I figured you were going to add more to it. Uh, we were going to correct it. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I can correct anything I've already written. So, okay. yeah, no, it's just to kind of get a start on it and kind of look at it and peruse it. That's all. I can't okay. stop him, Kimberly. He, he's <laughs> well, so that, that, that clarified, that was my question. And yeah. Just a weird follow-on question. When you say biker, are you talking about road cyclists or Bicyclists, motorbikes? yes. Bicyclists. Yeah, okay. bicycle. All right. Thanks. More from the council? All right, hey. hearing none from the council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we move to the consent agenda. Um, there's Greg, least I do answer. have an announcement. Oh, as, as a government announcement from the Montero It's Water a government Center? announcement, but it's not really from me. It's from the RCD, uh, but they contacted me. At, I, I will put it on next door, but I don't know if the council wants to put it on the MCC website. They they got some more funding, so they've added one more chipping date. And as I drive around, I see lots of wood debris still, so it might be something people want to work on over the uh, Memorial Day weekend. And um, it, the next chipping date for the coast side is June 2nd, one pile per household. And it's for all residents of El Granada, Moss Beach, and Montera. So um, you have to register at the fire at uh, San Mateo RCD org, but I will post. I'll post this and I'll email it to you so you can post it. Okay, I am posting it on next door, but you can post it on uh, MCC if people are interested right, to clear from vegetation. Thank you. All right, now public comment is the next issue and that's where Steve you've been waiting yes thank you uh, I'm a uh, I'm a board member on the senior co-siders group and we stopped by a few of us stopped by and last year and made some just general announcements to your council and um, we just want to make it a policy of, of dropping by possibly on a yearly basis and just updating the council so that you, you as uh, individuals, you as council members, you, the general public and word of mouth gets out that we are still uh, very actively seek to serve the community in the best way we can. And we were very fortunate this last COSAG co gives at the start of the month to receive $114,000 in donations. And so with that amount of money, we just feel um, a great importance to serve, to give back to the community and serve the community. And uh, in two weeks, we have our home repair day, which is an annual event. We're doing repairs and fix ups for about 20 homes on the coast. And I believe there's only one or two that are in the El Granada, Moss Beach, Montara area. So we, we just want to, if, if word of mouth is the only way to do it, we want to get the word out that we are here to repair homes. At, if, if the homeowners qualify, they have to meet a financial need. Uh, the, we are here to repair homes, not only on that day, but, but throughout the year. And the other exciting news that is just going to uh, take place within the next month is Senior co Setters has purchased a van with a wheelchair lift. So we will now be able to provide transportation to seniors that want to come to the uh, center for meals or activities or programs. And um, we won't have to rely on ready coasts or any other form of transportation. So we just want that word to get out. We just want uh, everybody to aware that we are uh, very grateful for the community's support of our organization. And we 
want to make sure that we can benefit the, the uh, community as best as we can. Steve, could you either paste it in the chat or email the council the information on your transportation program and other programs? I know some people who would be very interested in if that van is willing to drive from Montero to Half Moon Bay on occasion. I know some people who could take advantage of it. Yeah. It's it's not active yet, but I will put the I'll put the senior co-signers website link on there. Uh, as I said, they just purchased the van, and so right now Right now, we are looking for a full-time bus driver as an employee. So you can put the word out there, or if you know anybody who wants that 40 hour a week job, that's out there too. Okay, Steve, thank you for coming by. And I look forward to uh, getting that reminder from you. Um, perhaps we'll have to invite you back to discuss more of your programs in Minnesota. Gus, you had a question. Great. Thank you. Hey, Steve, uh, would you just repeat again the, the date of the, the home repair um, thing? That's on June 2nd. June 2nd. Awesome. And unfortunately, all, all the projects have been assigned. There are a number of volunteers that work on that project. The houses and the repair projects have been assigned. Uh, oh, but okay. we encourage people to, like I said, it's a year-long process. So or a year-long activity. So if somebody has, a senior has any special needs like grab bars or anything throughout the year, they can just call the senior center and we'll send somebody out to put up grab bars or do any emergency repairs. Awesome. Thank you. By the way, I went to the open house you guys had a couple of weeks ago. I really was impressed by the, by the team there. Great organization. Great. It is. It's a fantastic organization. <clears throat> Thanks, Thank Andy. you. All right. Um, Sid, your hand's still up. Is this public comment now, or was that a leftover? Not hearing. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the consent agenda then. Um, there are no minutes that I'm aware of for the May 17th retreat, and I don't know that they're legally required. I didn't make any yet, but I could if you want me to. Well, what I did was I wrote up one man's version of what I thought I heard from you ought to do, and that's posted for a discussion tonight. Okay. But um, let me check, Scott. We may have to do minutes, but they're not available for approval on the consent agenda tonight. No, that's the point. No. The minutes of May 10th are, I believe they've been scoured with a fine tooth comb and corrected. Uh, are we prepared to consent to approve the minutes of May 10th? Were they were the were the revised minutes posted? As far as I know, check the website. I put I put up there the ones with all the yellow and red removed after certain people had been involved in editing it. I saw your okay. name. I'm I sorry, I didn't, I didn't see if they did change. <laughs> okay, so uh, I propose we adopt the minutes of uh, May 10th. Who the minutes of May 10th? I second that. Okay, ready to go? Yeah, go. Okay, Greg. Yes. And yes. Uh, Gus, yes. Kimberly? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Dan? Yes. Uh, Claire? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, council activity, um, we already discussed it briefly. We are going to have a booth on June 10th. Um, I, I just want to open it up for a brief discussion. I'll just tell you what our current thoughts are. Leo Gomez is going to come. He's going to bring some handouts about the need for community fiber network and the report we produced. Um, which has been endorsed now by Montero, Water Sanitary District by Sam. I think we're going to get an endorsement of the findings from Granada. Uh, and the school district has also said they would send an endorsement. So um, we're going to hand out information about maybe forming community fiber network, Captain Bay's agreed in concept to study the problems. We also are going to have a suggestion box because I thought one of our functions was listening. Uh, and now it appears we will have some information about fentanyl and, um, and other stuff. So Jill Grant's agreed to work on it with me as has Leo, and I can't remember, I know Claire could be, on, could be up to this, but I don't know if Claire, if you actually had the time to come on that date or who on the council wants to um, show up at, at the booth on June 10th. I'm, I'm I, Sorry, Claire. Yeah, I, I have not committed to doing it. I, I think I'm really glad the MCC is doing it and I'll help if I can, but I'm, I would I would encourage other people to get the experience. Okay. 
Well, so I, right now it's Leo, me, and Jill Grant, and uh, I might be able to get some other people um, from the transportation committee to come. What about other people on uh, the communications committee? I'll probably be there. Scott is a maiden. Yes. I need to be there for, I don't know, maybe it's six hours. Great exposure. No, it's four hours, and we wouldn't expect a lot. Just long enough to give us a bath and break. I can definitely do that. Okay. So, great. Can I ask you real quick? Are we on, on, we're on the council member activities, right? We're under uh, item 5A, council member activity. Yeah, I see the June 10th community preparedness day. Assignments and schedule. Jill and I are going to go try and correct this uh, stuff we have from the last time we did the boot, make sure it still works. Um, and uh, probably I'll end up transporting it. I don't know if there's a lot to discuss there. Newsletter. Somebody wanted a newsletter and wanted to discuss assignments and schedule for a newsletter. It was one of the things we discussed on the retreat as community outreach that we could be doing. I think community outreach got the sentiment of being something to emphasize why we're doing the preparedness day booth. So um, who wants to volunteer to run an effort uh, to put together the newsletter? I, of course, will do the the tech stuff, I will, you know, I'll get it translated. I will get the email thing ginned up and, you know, the website stuff all done and distributed. But who's gonna, who's gonna edit, who wants to contribute, who, who still thinks it's a good idea? Can I? What I wanted to say is that what we've traditionally done is uh, sort of taking a, a brief look back at what we've done in the last few months and see which of these things we'd like to write about and then assign topics for people to write something. It's not something long, something, I don't know, what did we say about three other words or something like that? Um, and um, so I, I, would, I would envision that's what we would do is decide on topics and decide who's going to write what. Scott, raise so, his hand for something. So can we throw in there, you already have um, the fiber network in the can. You have your SAM report already in the can. There might be other things that are already ready to go for this newsletter that just need to be put into the newsletter. And that would be easy, right? Well, what's my SAM report? You mean the stormwater report? Will work? Stormwater, yeah, well, yeah. That won't be ready for weeks to probably the end of June. Okay. I mean, we could register it as a point. We're doing the report. I could write a couple of paragraphs testifying to what Burnett and the people on Second Street and others have, have said, but it won't be the report. It'll just be, if you're interested in contributing to the report, let us know. That's okay. what that's what I would put in a newsletter that's coming out in a few weeks. So when exactly does the newsletter get distributed? What date? I, I, there is no date. It's a, We rely on the initiative of the council members to define the tasks and the schedule. Okay. I'm available to produce it. That is to publish, distribute, translate when you all are ready. So it always varies. It's never at the same, roughly the same time. No, it's an ad hoc life. Okay, that's clear. Sorry. It's, it's, I can I, I, about every four months. Every yeah, three months. it has in the past been about three times a year. Okay. I, there's yeah, I can come up with something definitely on what I'm doing now. That's easy and will be ready by. And when and you say you want it, yeah. Who, who's going to be the editor for this or the? I'll, I'll, I'll edit the submissions. That's what we'll edit the submissions. Uh, who's going to put in the form of a newsletter? I will. Okay. I'm, I'm responsible for all that web stuff. Okay. So what's needed now? Topics, materials, Topics. content, <laughs> volunteers. Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, should we, do we as a should we as a group choose what three topics? How many topics oh, do you put in there? Well, we we always do as a group choose. It doesn't have to be three; it could be five. But you know, okay. what 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 Scott is saying, he's volunteering me to write two articles: one on the fiber network, I only one on this four hours. It's easy to just shove it in there. So now, what else do people think that our constituents need to know or? hear about concerns about the harbor, transportation. I know Len has a bunch of things that he's going to talk about at our next meeting on transportation. I don't know if he's willing to write those up or Gus is, but you know, there's, there's stuff going on. Well, maybe one thing is we, if it goes out before the emergency preparedness, then we sort of provide a heads up. No, I doubt it will. I mean, well, then after we provide a report, right.
I could write something about um, uh, Scott's presentation from the school district. You mean Sean? Yeah, whatever his name was, yes. Harvard guy. No, no, the, the school district person, Sean. The guy, Sean, Sean McFedrick. Yeah, the two, two new schools. Yeah, the two new schools are coming. Somebody so can write something. There are not two new schools coming, but he's going to, he, there's some remodeling at two schools. Right. I'll do the new coastal trail. You know the new trail. Scott wants to do the new coastal trail. Yeah, the new light. Kimberly's taking notes. Am I sensing a sort of leadership role here? <laughs> I'm thinking. Okay, so is there, is there anything, Anne, you want to write about? The sure. fire stations? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so, so, so uh, Anne seems to be interested. She might write something about the fire station. I've already got the two articles. Okay. Uh, so can we, can we set a deadline on June 15th for article submissions, and then I'll edit them, and then we publish it on June 30th? Well, is, is that too late? To... That's easy for me. I can certainly hit June 15th. I could hit earlier than that. Our next meeting is June 10th. So we can discuss the status on June 10th. And, and by then, I hope, you know, we've got stuff in motion. Okay, sounds sounds good to me. Yeah. Well, could I volunteer Kimberly as head of the ad hoc committee on the newsletter, making sure everybody else does the work? And sure, I could share that. Because I she can edit. She's a heck of an editor. Well, well Gus was going to edit. So. Yeah, but I'm telling you, Kimberly's got some oh. skills. All right. I, so, could, I could share that okay. responsibility. So, so, so let, me run, let me run down this list real quick. So Claire's going to do something on, on the school improvements. Anne's going to do the fire station. I tricked Greg into doing stormwater and the fiber network. And I'm going to do the new trail. And Kimberly's the editor. Do we have any other content that we mentioned? Okay, so that's done. Well, you know, we might end up saying something about the federal crisis. As Kimberly just suggested, if, if we're going to this emergency preparedness day, you know, that we'll see how it comes out. Oh, let's see what they give us. Um, as you heard from my impassioned statement earlier, I take this drug stuff seriously. It's deadly stuff. Well, also, your suggestion box might help. Yes, the suggestion. We'll let you know right. what the public is looking for as well. And so that could also kind of be a. Okay, so I think we've discussed the newsletter enough. Now, we have a retreat follow-up document, which none of you had time to read, and if you're like me, you didn't even have internet today. I did read it. Okay, so um, are, are you interested in discussing this now, or do you want to pend it for a subsequent agenda? Uh, how do you want to handle it? It's now 928. Uh, Meaning uh, we have about 20 minutes if we keep the agenda or we could wrap it up sooner. What do you want to do? I'll defer to my fellow council members. I couldn't hear you. I said I'll defer to my fellow council members. What's what's, what's on the agenda for next time? All right. For next time, we have the transportation report, which you and Len, I believe, have been working on. And there's some serious issues there with the confluence of the Highway 1 and the and, and, and I don't even know everything that's going on. One shoreline talking about moving the brave water and all kinds of stuff. Yes, going on. Like, yes three different things going on. Right. Same place. Yeah. Um, we also have Parks has asked to come and talk about the status of the off-leash pilot for dog walking at Quarry Park. Um, and then we could talk about follow-up on the MCC retreat. But, but that sounds like a great idea. On the 24th, we have people threatening to volunteer to present things about Harbor and Shoreline. Great. Okay. Awesome. And and then we probably would be discussing follow-up on the retreat. Because this stuff is going to involve us writing letters. I mean, depending on the decisions we all decide we're comfortable with making, mm -hmm. you know, there should be a raft of letters that we should be writing or study groups forming. Okay. Uh, and what did you want to? Did you want to say something? This? When I saw Lynn put his hand up, and it, it, down, was, it went down. His so. hand went down. Okay. Um, so, with, with respect to the retreat, um, or do you want us to in our heads when we when, this is going to be put on for the next week? Do you want us to make a decisions on what's most important? Are we ready to decide what what's most important? This is the fascinating. This is the fascinating thing. 
Yeah, yeah. Because we discussed that before. We like, did. We did discuss that. So what I would say is I will turn this into a shared document on Google instead of just the PDF. But I will not give you edit authority because when I do that, documents tend to disappear. Some strange stuff has happened. But I allow you to all be commenters and you'll all be able to make copies of it and edit it as you see fit if you want separately. Okay. So you haven't had a, a chance to, to react to what I think. Now, with respect to prioritization, you'll read at the bottom of my write up that I'm resisting this because what's our budget? Why should we be prioritizing things before we know how much money we are entitled to have spent in our area? I want to know what the money flow is to, to the point you raised, Dr. Bollinger, at the last meeting. I also think there are certain kinds of things that are requests for information or policy changes that don't cost money. Those don't have to be prioritized. Okay. Um, maybe I have a problem with what's the word? You're a hoarder. Control. control. Oh, you don't know. You're a, you're the content control. You won't throw anything away. I, I yeah. I, <laughs> I, I think that there's issues that right. our constituents have brought up, and I don't feel, you know, happy about telling somebody they're number four. You know, uh, I want to see what the county says when we bring things forward about why they can't do something. So that's my reaction to prior this. That said, sure, there are things we're going to ask for money for. Those might have to be prioritized, but again. Well, how much money do we have to spend? How much money have they been spending over here, Ann? Zero. Like nothing. Okay. And the thing is, I, I did want to make a point. A lot of times the measure K funds are going out. Uh, for example, there was just one at the last Board of Supervisors meeting where it, it is for uh, indigent homeowners uh, over the hill. And they're going to give $40,000 for home repair for two homes. And Mr. Silveria, I mean, he's been begging for help to to just not be flooded out of his home. I mean, I think it's an extreme, you know, example of where there should be an effort made to stop this, you know, from happening. And I feel like if you're going to just help somebody, and and, and it's it's different from the senior co-starters that are it's it's a where you know they're taking donations and doing work the county is actively giving money to these nonprofits for this work and i feel like well do we need to establish a, a nonprofit for the mid coast where we just we can then distribute money and we ask the county for money i mean i don't know but there's got to be some way to get the things that we need on the coast done okay and, and let me just a little bit more <laughs> some of the things we're asking for are merely enforcement that's not happening, like the lights on the fire station in El Granada, okay? Uh, some of the things could involve funding and they're from different departments. So why do we have to prioritize it, you know, as Department A versus B versus C? There will be cases, though, and the Department of Public Works is just fine. So we're discussing this. It's not on the agenda. This is on the agenda. It's item 5C. Um, so in Department of Public Works, we asked for safe routes to school kind of signs around Paramount View School, and they said, oh, you're gonna need a big traffic study. Well, we're also gonna be asking for stormwater work and culverts on streets on 2nd Street and on Quarry Park, that's DPW. So I can see we might get to the point if somebody says, do you want $600,000 for a transportation study to analyze proper traffic controls in Montana and El Granado, or would you rather have fixes to stormwater? I can, you know, after we see what the dollar amounts are, we might, prioritize that. That's within one department. It's a hierarchy of money. I could understand that. Okay. But I think we'll discuss this in more detail in subsequent meetings. And you all should hopefully get internet and have a chance to comment on this um, and bring that to the next meeting. Um, okay. In terms of future issues, we just said transportation update June 10th. Probably Quarry Park, Leash Dog Park, bringing more on the retreat on the 24th. Something on uh, the harbor. Uh, Kimberly, would you care to approximately? Not on June 10th. June 24th. Didn't I just say June 24th? On June 24th. Uh, did, you, did you have a title for it? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, and at some point, Claire, you wanted to talk about updates on the CARES program. Is that something that could happen as soon as June? 
they're able to come whenever we would like them to come. And I think we, we were talking about one of the times in June, haven't made a decision. Do you have a preference? Well, we seem to be a little light on the tent if they're not going to take a lot of time, but we also have space on the 24th. Why don't, why don't I ask them if they can come on the 10th? Okay, that's great. Burnett, well, what will they be reporting on that's new? Uh, they, 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 they've, they've done this for a year now. They have statistics on how it's going. They're changing their financing and their structures and their contract. And uh, so we'd like to see what's, and we also want to make sure that they're servicing the mid coast because there are rumors that they're not. So we, those are the basic things that I'm looking for. Well, uh, that that would be an important thing to understand. Burnett, did you have a comment on future agendas yeah, just, here? Yeah, just a quick comment. Comment. I just wanted to thank uh, Ann for the comments that she made. But on the Measure K money, I would invite people to take a look at the agenda for the last board of uh, supervisors meeting and see what how much Measure K money they've handed out and what it was for. Uh, luckily, Ray got a little bit of it, and also there's actually a website with some goals as to the what county uh, wants to do with the Measure K money, if you want to take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are reports on that. Um, I've asked Ann to add up every Measure K expense for the last year and a half uh, and, and see where the money's going. I'm waiting. <laughs> All right. I'm waiting to match uh, I'm sensing there's some people who would like to adjourn. Yes. For everybody. Do we finish council activities? I've got a couple of things. Go ahead. Council activity. We did A, B, and C, but go D. Okay. okay. Um, first, uh, just on the, on the fiber thing, I ran a, a poll on Civico again, and uh, literally 100% respondents, which was 14, which is 50% better than the last time, but 100% right. of the people are very thrilled with the idea that we would explore the way that 0% of them were satisfied with internet here, and 100% of them were excited about the idea of a community fiber network. And I have to say that in these turbulent times, getting that many people to 100% agree on literally anything is kind of a minor miracle. So well, I think the interesting thing about it is it will pay for itself. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're asking for a perpetual expense okay. to keep a memorial park bench available forever at an infinite cost. You know, it's it's got an economic side to it. Yeah. And then the second thing is Kimberly and I met about the uh, outreach that he was going to do a quick update on that. We're all on board with that. Um, Closer to the mic, I think. Okay, so, uh, so one thing we talked about was uh, when we put together a calendar, uh, I think the operational way to do that is to have uh, the chair should probably be the person who is the administrator of an MCC Gmail account because you can create a calendar in there. You can make Kimberly and I the administrators of the calendar. We can put into the calendar all the upcoming things that will be happening that we might want to have a presence at. And then Kimberly and I at each meeting can just let everybody know over the next couple of weeks, here are the opportunities that we have to make an appearance at events around the coast side. Um, people don't have to do anything. Nobody's got to do anything, but we can just offer here the opportunities that anyone who wants to sign up and then we will be, I think, more organized and consistent about making appearances at local events, which is a good way of, of increasing our visibility. Is, is, but is, I, I have yeah. two, two comments. Okay, yes. One comment is, I, I am probably not the only person, but I have a password uh -huh. for Mid Coast Community Council's email account, okay. which has a calendar. Okay. If you will show me how to make yeah. you guys administrator, I'd be happy to let you do that. But the yeah. second comment yes. is, Lisa Ketchum would kill us if we didn't point this out. We have a calendar on our website. Yeah, but okay. Yes, so you've got to explain to me and Lisa why that calendar is. I mean, because that calendar on the website that no one's supposed to come here, and then when all the county meetings are, yeah, I use it, that. It thing. has it has a whole lot of stuff on. Yeah, yeah. the problem is like I got to do too much work. Like the, if you, what I can do, what any of us can do with that calendar from that Gmail account is you can just set it to like when I open up my calendar, all that stuff automatically comes into. My phone. So you don't so have to go, go to another, go, another, another thing. I look up the like. It's just it reduces the barriers to accessing the information. And we'll we'll or right. not, I'll handle it. You know, okay. All right, as long as you and touch base with Lisa, okay? Because <laughs> she put lots of effort to make sure our calendar is populated. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. governmental meeting you ever oh, get. Oh, the thing like, costs. Like, that's, that's great. I'm not saying we should replace that. Okay. I'm saying. That this is an outreach count, and it's, it, and it's it got to outreach to be an outreach count. Yes. Okay. Yes. I get it. I get it. Um, 
Sí. Uh, sí. Como que sea, mi que chiste que me toca de ahí, me toca más de ahí. Bueno, well, and I will, I will be putting like more of our agendas and things into Civic Bell and pushing it out that way. Um, so it's just another avenue of, of reaching people. Um, and then I'll be going around to our community, uh, kind of door to door over the next several months anyway. Um, so I'll be trying to promote us that way. So there'll be lots of opportunities to increase that. All right, you can ping me about Civic Bell. Claire? I wanted to say thank you to Gus. I think that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Sid, is your hand still up from before? I can't remember. No, I just wanted to say um, something about what Ann said in Measure K. I have been kind of griping about them never giving the Midcoast any money. And so at least starting for the two May meetings, I made an Excel spreadsheet and I had what I decided to do, but I haven't done it yet is to put down the zip code of the recipients and the town they're in, because even though Ray gave out some money this time for the first time since he became a, a supervisor, it went to like Green Foothills and Pescadero and not places on the mid coast. Although I, you know, Obviously, Green Foothills is an admirable entity, but um, you know, I don't know how we can put our hand out if we don't have a nonprofit or something behind our name. That's all I'm saying. I'll talk with her about it if you want. Her perspective: The county did contribute several hundred thousand dollars last year to a number of wildfire-related issues out here: the removal of the trees and the medians in El Granada, the scoping project of El Granada. Oh, come on, help me out! I'm forgetting more. Was that Measure K money? I, I don't know, but they helped us oh, get money. I'm, I'm talking kidding. Measure K. So right. specifically, right. that's what I made the Excel spreadsheet. So I can put my email in the chat if she wants to exchange emails, and I'll send her what I've got. Thank you. Well, I, I did send a spreadsheet to Ray, um, and I'm going to say it was the end of February, with a list of 70 or so things on it. You saw it. I brought it up at the council, mm -hmm. including the swimming pool for Kaplan Bay Cabrillo School, which he mentioned they're going to do something about. I don't know. I never received a reply. I don't know what he did about the 50 things that were on the list. And the numbers were in the hundreds of millions. So, you know, it was a lot. Um, I'm talking about, about when the county approves Measure K at the Board of Supervisors meeting. They all so, five have to approve it. And it's district discretionary funding, which each supervisor gets one. I think it's $100,000. I ever forget. They divide it up by five. So whatever the amount was. But Ray just now, for the very first time, started funding some Measure K money out of his district discretionary funds. I'm aware of that, and there was a prior deadline, and I sent him a spreadsheet in advance of that in the hopes that he would look at that. So, all right. Yeah. I think he I needs think a specific, specific that's request. That's all. Um, it, and if you want, I'll put my email in the chat, and you can send me your info. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else do we want to talk about? That's it. That was a hint. Uh, motion to adjourn? Yes. Seconded. Call the roll, please. Uh, call the roll one more. You don't have to call We, we, we agreed, didn't we? I don't know. Uh, we, we can throw it out. Greg, and yes. Yes, yes. yes. Us, yeah, Kimberly, yeah. me, you, Claire. Claire. Yes. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>